All right, you're ready to call the meeting to order at 702. Ready to call the meeting to order at uh, 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock. 702. All right, Director Jones? Present. Director McLaughlin? Here. Director Bernstein? Director Bernstein, you're on mute. I uh, thought I saw Chuck online here somewhere. Thank you. Right. Director uh, Crawley? Present. And Director Solano? Here. Everybody all accounted for. Uh, we uh, have a Pledge of Allegiance. Could we uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Mm -hmm. Okay. I Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to the Republic, Republic for which, for which it, stands, it stands, one nation. nation. Under God, under God is indivisible, individual, liberty, liberty, and justice for all. all. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, the uh, reportable items uh, out from our closed session um, items uh, for our closed session uh, regarding the ASME are, are as follows. Uh, the board uh, in closed session tonight approved a tentative agreement for a uh, successor uh, MOU with ASME Local 829. Uh, the tentative agreement is for a six month term from July 1 uh, 2020 through December 31st, 2020, with a 1% wage increase to be effective September 16th, 2020. The remaining, uh, item number two, the remaining of the changes to uh, expire uh, MOU are clean up to clarify language uh, or to reflect existing practices and legal requirements. Point three, uh, the ASME membership already ratified the tentative agreement contingent upon a board approval in which the board did uh, tonight. The district will sunrise the tentative agreement on a, a district site for, um, uh, for 30 days beginning uh, tonight uh, in the form of a draft red line successor MOU. Uh, and the last point is the cost of the 1% uh, wage increase uh, amendment to the MOU will be an additional $4,000 for the term of the MOU and $13,800 per year. The board has had also agreed to uh, come back together on September 21st uh, at five o'clock for a special board meeting uh, to begin to um, 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 to start our, our process for uh, the second uh, uh, engaging it, uh, Eddie, for a second round of talks around uh, the um, the agreement with ASME. Uh, did I anybody think of it? Did I miss anything? Or? So, President Jones, if you could just, uh, I think the record should reflect that the board's vote on this was unanimous. Okay, um, I, I couldn't hear you that well, Steve. What was that? I just suggested that the record should reflect that the board's vote was unanimous. Yes, the, we had a unanimous 5-0 vote in favor of this particular uh, ratification. So, um, no further um, additions. Uh, we'll move on uh, to public comment uh, number two. Michelle, is there any um, anybody in the queue that want to talk? There is no public comment. No public comment. Okay, we'll move into the agenda item. Uh, report from the chief. Um, are you alive? Are you there, chief? I am. Can you hear me? Uh, for me, um, it's very vague. I might have to go back out and come back in, but go ahead. Well, I'll try and talk uh, louder. Oh, it's not so you. If, if you follow the chief's report, uh, we have a new deputy chief. Uh, chief Stevens, as you know, will be retiring. Okay. And uh, that'll be sometime in October. 
but we start a transition. Uh, Chief, Chief Schaefer uh, has agreed to be the next deputy chief, so you can congratulate him. Uh, I know he's on the call tonight for a little bit. And uh, so I don't know if he wants to say a few words. He's certainly capable of doing that if, uh, if we can unmute him. But, uh, you know, he will take over starting in September. We'll do a transition through the month uh, with Chief Stevens there. And, uh, you know, as I said, then by the end of September, early October, you know, Mike will be the, uh, will run solo and uh, Jim will finish up whatever he needs to finish up and he will retire. So I appreciate both of their, Mike stepping up and, uh, you know, Jim's time, because he obviously extended out past when he could have gone last year and he did not have to do that. So I certainly want to say that I appreciate that. He's also watching tonight as well. So I don't know if, if Mike is out there, if he wants to say anything, Michelle, if you can unmute uh, Chief Schaefer, that would be great. Yeah, he has the ability to unmute himself. Mike, if you want to... There's a speaker and you could highlight over your name and click unmute. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Mike, can you, uh, can you hear us? Uh, I, I can hear you. Are you able to hear me? We can hear yes. you. Chief, did you want to? I don't, I don't yeah, know. Mike, 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 go ahead and say whatever you got to say. I mean, obviously, it's a little awkward over uh, Zoom, but. <laughs> now, I, uh, I have the computer going and I have the phone going, and I'm not sure which one is actually working, so I apologize. Well, we can hear, um, we can hear it. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and Chief Chapel Holman, thank you for the opportunity to take on a uh, new responsibility and new position. I look forward to it, and. Uh, We'll try to follow in Chief Stevens' footsteps and uh, do my best. And I really look forward to, uh, to, my, to my new role. Super. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mike. So moving, moving on to the, uh, the next thing, new firefighters, as you saw in the report, uh, the final six uh, personnel who were on probation uh, successfully completed probation, which is great. I sent you an email on that. But at the bottom there, it says that in the last five years, we hired 42 personnel. And of those 42, 40 successfully passed uh, probation. And so, uh, you know, unfortunately, two were not. But out of a total workforce of, a, of 100, you can see that's a significant uh, increase and uh, transition uh, for people that had been here, retired, and then, you know, filling those spots. So we've, we've come a long way. Uh, ideally, we would have hired again by now, but with COVID and also, you know, some issues with the County Fire Academy, which we think we're going to have worked out uh, in the near future, um, you know, that's, that's a huge, that's been a huge accomplishment for the agency. And I wanted to say uh, to Chief Schaefer, who was in, was in training, uh, that's still a big item on their plate because all of those uh, personnel want to become drivers now, whether it's not just engine and, and, and truck, uh, it's rescue and so forth. So, you know, that commitment hasn't ended, that, that amount of training hasn't slowed down. The only thing where we get a little bit of a breathing gap is in hiring people. So we don't have a consecutive probationary group in the queue for the first time in five years. So they get, they get a slight break, but then again, not really. Uh, wrote up there the wildland fire deployments that we had had. Uh, as of today, we have seven personnel out. That started on Sunday. Uh, we sent a strike team and a strike team leader. So strike team engine, uh, four personnel, and then a strike team leader, a chief officer, um, there in Monterey County at the River Fire, uh, Matt Menard is out as a medical unit leader again on the team that he's on. And I understand he's at the Dome Fire, um, which is in the Mojave or somewhere in Riverside uh, area. So uh, I know we sent one more person out this morning, a line EMT, but who could also be a paramedic. And it escapes me where they went. So we have a little bit of bandwidth left. Uh, I know there's a fire in Southern San Mateo County today. Uh, just 
rekindle. I listened to that a few minutes ago, but uh, or it's new. And it looks like they got that under control now as well. So we had been, been talked about flying the drones for that event, but they had helicopters up. So I think it was mostly just a lot of, a lot of talk. Uh, you can see where we are with the COVID-19 number of cases, how many calls we've actually received. That's always up on the weekly uh, updates now that we give. And uh, space needs, we'll discuss tonight an element of that. Uh, the Chiefs group was able to meet which, is, which was good and we did that responsibly and safely with a smaller group, or, group of people and no deputy chiefs really. Um, uh, East Palo Alto, as you may know, had a double fatality in a shooting, North Fair Oaks, or excuse me, the county area, Sequoia area, also had a double fatality with a triple stabbing. Um, you know, we had a number of other calls in the district that were violent. And so we seem to see a trend developing, at least that's what I'm seeing across the region of, and I don't know why, um, but you know, I think part of it's just people being cooped up and then just also a lot of other factors in play. Menlo Park, I did talk to the mayor, uh, saw her yesterday with uh, Betsy Nass, one of the other council members walking around downtown, but she wanted to ask about testing and she wanted to talk about homeless encampments, and then she also wanted to talk about uh, ways in which, you know, how we operate with law enforcement, which is information that I had sent to them. There is a new interim police chief in Menlo Park. I've not spoken to him yet. Ryan has, because Ryan's obviously on contract over there for emergency preparedness. Um, we did have more fires and medical incidents uh, in the triangle again, at least two fires in one day and a medical call that turned violent on an overdose, uh, uh, I think within that same week. So that's still active out there, obviously trying to resolve some of that. And uh, Urban Search and Rescue is getting ready to do their ARE, Administrative Readiness Evaluation. So that's coming up at the end of the year. Hard to believe we're almost to the end of the year. We're getting there. Um, Slack, we're working on the agreement. That should come to you in September. Facebook's on the um, on the uh, you know on the direct diversity asked some questions about that, but you know we're trying to redo the agreement there uh, because we were not able to get and I had answer all the questions that Director Bernstein uh, had asked and we'd sent those to you. But the bottom line is the incumbent currently in there who moved to Florida, uh, Facebook would like to continue with that individual, but we don't see that as an employee. We see that more as a contract for services. And I can certainly go into that more as we work with Facebook to see if that's uh, possible to be done. Finally, um, finally on that board related matters, obviously Director Jones and Director McLaughlin and myself get together for the agenda setting, but I also was contacted and I wanted to be transparent that, uh, you know, candidates, uh, Carpenter and Ballard did contact me, were interested in some of the issues related to the district. And, uh, you know, obviously I try to be careful with that because I'm not, I'm trying to be apolitical. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, we sat down at lunch, I paid for my food and uh, they, they seemed to be satisfied at least at that point with some questions that they had getting answered uh, regarding the run for the, for the fire board. So, that's my report. Happy to answer. Happy to answer any questions, uh, if you have any. Thank you, Chief. Or are they open it up for any board member that have something they want to talk? Got a question for the Chief? Robert. Virginia. Hi. Thanks, Harold, for your update. Just a quick question: How many fires have we had since sheltering in place? Um, was a, took effect for in that triangle area from that time uh, until now it seems to be one at least every month oh more than that um we're probably i think i gave you last time in the report oh we were over 30 with what we just have been you know dealing with i wouldn't put it past that we're closer to 40 uh um, fire calls since the first of the year, and a hundred total over three years, right, of, of just emergency incidents. The other thing that we're working on, we have to check out, was there was a 
fatality out there. A uh, guy on his bike the other night at four o'clock in the morning, Adams and University. So my, my suspicion is, uh, and this is just in the paper, there's a name, so I'm gonna try and backtrack this. But you know, if you're riding your bike at 4.30 in the morning down around Adams and University, there's a, a probably a chance that you came out of the triangle. So, uh, or you were headed there. So at this point, we'll see if that's also another element because you know, to get in and out of there, um, to get out and about, people are walking that live in there or they're riding bikes or that some actually have uh, vehicles as well. So, you know, it's hard to say if that was a call, but yeah, it's significant. And we have not had that number um, in the last two years. I mean, this is the whole point, right? All, the call activity has increased out there. Um, smaller, some are small cooking fires, um, others are not. And, uh, you know, the majority all related to the encampments, uh, as you know, I think very rarely are they not. Um, and the medical calls uh, seem to be taking on a little bit different uh, twist. Uh, the one that they had, again, like I said, was an overdose that, you know, degraded into a, into a, um, a fight and so law enforcement had to get involved uh combative patient i guess is the best way to put it which you know also speaks to some of my concerns that i've tried to deal with with the city uh and what they're doing with law enforcement and this whole mentality that somehow uh people that are you know have psychiatric issues or drug dependency or that are living out there are always you know individuals that don't have a problem a being transported in an ambulance uh, or in being incarcerated for whatever reason. I mean, so there's, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not of the mind that you're going to de-escalate everything by having someone else do this. And remember the firefighters and the paramedics on the ambulance are the ones that are treating these patients. They're not being treated by law enforcement. So I think there's, there was this big misnomer, which I tried to send the smart car information to the city and I've actually gotten feedback from uh, Councilmember Nash and the mayor regarding that they had no idea that that was a countywide standard and a program. Um, and I think that's kind of the one of the things that I see as a problem, not to go too long here, but there's a lot of people suggesting alternative solutions who've never run call one. They've never been on the streets. They've never had to deal with calls like that. So, you know, we're we're able to do what we need to do with the assistance of law enforcement who is specifically there if people start to get out of hand. We're not gonna deal with combative patients. We'll assist where we can safely, probably more to just be able to get them into restraints. But the system works extremely well the way that it's devised. The smart cars are there if they need them. There's policies around that. That's a countywide thing. It's not as if one singular entity can just start changing things within the EMS system. And that's a good thing. Um, and so, you know, when people are making suggestions about what it could look like or what it could be, I, what I see a lot of is just ignorance and people who don't know what they're talking about. And I think if you were to press some of those people regarding what their field experience would be, it's, it's zero. So, you know, I'm, I, I understand the desire to, to change things, but that, that's part of what I discussed with the mayor. You gotta be very careful on you know where where law enforcement is and what they're doing or what you perceive them to do, especially on some of these you know calls that can get violent uh, with patients that, again the the one we're talking about was you know related to a, a drug overdose. That's that is not an unusual circumstance. So that said, uh, if there's no other questions, thank right. you. Yeah, I, I, I have, have a question, question. Robert. Uh, uh, Jim. You know, uh, you Chuck. Chief, regarding the, the Facebook agreement, uh, will the contract be between uh, uh, the, the individual, I believe is in Florida and the district or between Facebook and the, uh, and the contractor? Yeah, Are there two contracts here or just one? Just one. And so part of when we entered into that, we did so because, you know, it's a different environment today too, right? Facebook looks like they're not probably gonna uh, you know, open back up until next year, I'm here in June or July. And then only then at 25%, and then eventually you get to 50%, um, not, not what they were. So you know, there was a benefit as we saw it to have someone within the planning 
training, preparedness element. We still see that, but you know, we've tried to replace this individual so far and not met with a lot of success uh, for a variety of, I think, reasons, you know, kind of unfortunate. Ryan answers some of those for you in the report that I gave you and the questions that Chuck had asked. But, you know, to have someone working as an employee from Florida is different than if they live locally and could come in for meetings and so forth. So it's worked okay. It hasn't worked great. The COVID hasn't helped. Um, you know, we thought we were going to be able to replace this individual, uh, which was not his choice to leave. Just so you know, he had a family emergency and he had to move, you know, for family purposes. So all that said, you know, to kind of get to what you're asking, what we see is, this really isn't an employment relationship anymore in the traditional sense, even with the ability to work from home, home for him being Florida. Um, it's probably made it easier for that to happen because of what's going on. But equally, you know, it's, you know, the, the changes that Facebook, I, I don't think make this an, empl an employer situation anymore legitimately. So we're looking at a modified agreement for him where Facebook still pays those costs, but in partnership with the district. And then obviously Facebook would have the opportunity for things that maybe don't benefit the fire district directly, because that's the whole point here is that collaborative, mutually beneficial uh, relationship and, and work product that they could contract with him as well, if that's what they cho choose to do. So, you know, we're just trying to re update the relationship to what is actually going on. Um, I think we all wish that we would have had a person. However, that said, you know, with the campuses not opening back up, with the change of how they're going to do their business model, you know, I, I don't see even a 40 hour a week agreement being as relevant. You're probably looking at 10 hours a week through, through us in that arrangement if Facebook agrees. So I just want to give you a heads up because, you know, a lot of things have changed and certainly while Facebook wants to continue or wants us to continue with the individual, very happy with the work product, you know, we don't see that in an employment situation the way traditionally we'd had it where he was working for the fire district. So that's, that's the point of bringing that up. I'm just trying to give you a heads up that we're going to have a conversation with Facebook about this specifically. So the, the, the contract is between the district and the, uh, the individual contractor, and then we're reimbursed for some portion of it. Like yeah, hundred percent. I mean, so the way it worked is, for hours that he spent at Facebook, it's a hundred percent reimbursement. Right. For hours that he would work for us, we would delineate those, and that's on our dime. So if they needed some additional capacity to do district-wide projects, which we've been using, Mike, for some of the COVID updates that you see, he actually is behind the scenes doing that because he can do that from, you know, where he's working back in Florida. Um, that's, that's, that's how we are currently operating. Thank you. You're welcome. Chuck, you had something? Yeah, I, I had two, two things, um, that I wanted to mention, but I wanted to follow up. And one of them was Jim's comment. Um, yeah, I would strongly urge you chief to, um, let, let Facebook take the lead and contract with him. And if we need something from him, it seems like we could, we could, you know, contracts separately. But I think for Facebook to reimburse us for paying for him, I just don't think it, it looks right. It looked, it, I think to the public, it could look like we were somehow subsidizing Facebook's consultant. And I, I don't think we should be in that position. Um, and I don't see what benefit it, it, this has for us. So that, that's just a comment on, on, on that. Um, I wanna ask you though also about the, um, the firefighters uh, and the academy. Yeah, um, I've read, you know, accounts that that a number of um, fire agencies are going to be having some cutbacks and things like that. And I want to ask you about the feasibility of just hiring. I don't know the number, but let's say four or five lateral firefighters from other agencies. And I'm curious, what, what kind of training do they have to go through? They don't have to have an academy if they've already gone through that in some other jurisdiction. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think it's, you're partially correct. I mean, you still have to have some level of base entry level. But, you know, typically for what you're talking about, which is laterals, 
you know, you, you loosen up those requirements a little bit or there's less for them to, to have to do because, you know, we don't need to your point, I think is, is we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, we'll always look at the displaced firefighter list um, and we'll look at people, you know, if we can get people with skill like medic, paramedic, that's obviously desirable um, for us. That's not the only thing. But, you know, we'll always look at that first. And we've had a fair amount of success with some lateral hiring. Um, we've had, you know, other times where it didn't work out very well. And it's always a balancing act when you're trying to hire um, individuals that have, you know, the skills like a medic. At the same time, you have programs like your Explorer and Cadet program specifically where maybe they don't have all of those skills, but they were, you know, they were working for us through the college program, so to speak, through work experience. And so you've got to see them before. I mean, but COVID's, COVID's messed up a lot of that. And, uh, you know, the College of San Mateo has gone back and is doing their college academy and their college training, you know, with social distancing, masks, and all the protocols for sanitation. So slowly agencies are doing that. Now, again, to your point, but there is a lot of, there are a lot of agencies hiring too. So it's, it's an interesting time because I think some were going to do, you know, larger hirings like some of the big cities. And, but you're also, you're not, you're not incorrect that some agencies are going to start, if not have already started to, uh, you know, shed work workforce. So yeah, there's, there'll be opportunities and challenges and all that. And, uh, you know, we won't be going back out, um, for new firefighters I, until I think well coming up soon to, to, to get an eligibility list. So we will look at all of that. How, how long does it take to bring a lateral on board? And if you do that, do laterals also uh, go through a probationary period? So the answer to probationary period, everybody goes through probation. There's no, we don't skip that because it, it doesn't matter, right? Um, but in terms of the entry level academy, whether it's 14 or 16 weeks, because it depends on, you know, other agencies and what they, they want to do, um, we will modify at times part of that as well. And, you know, another great thing, if, if we can get it, if we can do it, is let's say they were a, they're a, a certified medic already, you know, one of the things that we can do a lot quicker, um, if not, that they're not from this county, is to get them their five call um, meaning they can actually work as a paramedic much sooner. Um, obviously, they come from San Mateo County, then you can do it right away. And, the, you know, those are all little small impediments. But, you know, again, we've, we've done okay with some laterals. Sometimes we haven't. It's, it's not a fit. Um, but you also don't want to cut off your nose to spite your face with kind of your entry-level programs that we have traditionally supported to get in um, people and, you know, support the, the College of San Mateo and the Fire Academy process. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Robert, I have a, I have a question. Rob. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Chief, uh, is there a specific modular training segment that you use for laterals where all laterals get to go through the, this a defined modular program? For training? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I know that we've, again, we've had abbreviated things that we don't need to do with, if we go strictly lateral, just because they're, they're more of a plug and play, supposedly. Um, but there are other, you know, there are all other quality assurance things that training wants to make sure that they have or know, so they don't either bomb or fail, or we're not disappointed because we we got somebody that said that they have certain, you know, skills and then they don't necessarily uh, meet the standard that we would expect. So, you know, I let training handle all that stuff. And, and I know HR, you know, we work with the individuals because certainly, you know, if they come in as a lateral, then there's a negotiation process with them on pay as well, because they may start at a little bit different point, right? If they're going to jump from somewhere else. But, you know, again, there's a whole... If they're displaced, I think that's easier to understand than if, you know, somebody decides they want to leave because, you know, what, what, what were those reasons? Was it mutual or, you know, are you inheriting somebody else's problem? So, you know, again, I, I, I feel always a lot better about the displacement list because 
those are people that had no intention of losing their job through no fault of their own. Now, the one part you got to watch out with that, and I've had, we've had bad experiences with Southern California on this, is then when they, you know, they reinstitute or reoffer the job, does that become a flight risk for you? You know, we have a very low, less than 1% turnover. That's a great thing. So, you know, but where we have had problems in the past too, is people coming out of Southern California and then either getting homesick and wanting to go back or the bigger departments that they wanted to get to eventually pick them up. Yeah. And yeah, did Robert may I ask a follow-up question? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, is there a specific hours for that, uh, for that modular, I don't know if I want to call it a refresher or a in-house orientation for a lateral, or does it change if they come from an agency, let's say that doesn't use a Pierce fire truck and uses a different type of fire truck. Is there an adjustment uh, period that your training officer does relative to some individual type training for that in, for that person, since they may have a different protocol for equipment and, you know, actually protocols that you're using in relationship to a department that they left? Yeah, so, you know, you jump into driver and that would not be something we do in the first year. So that part we're not worried about because, you know, if they were an engineer somewhere else, Meaning they drove the apparatus. That's nothing that you know we're going to worry about initially because they're not going to just start driving. They would have to pass probation, but they'll go through, you know, specific lateral groups. There's always kind of a, a reckoning, if you will, um, to make sure that people have what they need. And then if they have it, you know, then we don't need to go back and redo it. But there's, you know, you got to have some level of quality assurance that that actually occurs. I mean, you know, I'll give you an example on the paramedic front. You know, just because people are on an ambulance um, and they're a medic, I know that we've put people back through with Melanie as their kind of preceptor and as the you know, medical manager, that the skill level that you think they would have wasn't always there because they were, let's say, relatively new paramedics. So even though they have the title, it doesn't mean that they are as um, skilled or competent to meet a standard that we would be comfortable with without some remedial training. So, you know, it isn't, it isn't always, you know, a one for one. And so training, what training tries to do is figure out what, what do they have that's legit and then what don't they have. And, you know, what's interesting, and I know you're, you know, I don't know if this is where you're going, but I know that law enforcement has post. The fire service has tried to catch up to more of a singular standard, but still, that's elusive. So we don't necessarily, the fire service, it's better than it used to be, but we don't necessarily have one standard that fits across the whole state. Okay. That's, that's part of the problem. Is coming. Okay. Thank you, Keith. You're welcome. Thank you, Robert. Question for the chief. Thank you, chief, for your report. Um, we uh, hear no other um, uh, Questions for the chief. We'll move on to the general counsel report. Uh, Steve, are you there? I'm here. Good okay. evening. Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Great. Sure. Uh, thanks. So, at our last meeting, I mentioned that with your blessings and the fire chief's uh, encouragement, uh, I was going to start a practice of including this general counsel's report on each month's agenda. Um, and at least for the next few months, that report will be an opportunity for me to chat with you for a few minutes. I promise only five or 10 minutes um, about some core issues of particular relevance to me as a public agency lawyer and hopefully will be interesting to you as well. The goal is to be informational, of course, but more than that, um, I hope it's a chance for you to get to know me a little bit more and understand uh, what makes me tick as I start my tenure as your new general counsel. Uh, and so tonight I thought we might spend a bit of time on my favorite section of the Brown Act which is the definitional structure of committees. And I say my favorite portion with a little bit of sarcasm um, as may become clear. And if I'm doing this right, um, with Michelle's indulgence, I'm going to put up on the screen, are you seeing uh, what I'm seeing, which is a screen that says committees and the Brown Act? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Great. So, um, 
under the Brown Act, the meetings of an agency's quote, legislative body must be open to the public. And the question is, when is a committee a legislative body that is subject to the Brown Act? And you see in front of you the actual language from the Brown Act that defines the committees and answers this question. It is uh, a, a pretzel-like piece of statutory drafting, but we'll work through it together. There are three parts to this structure. The first part is very broad. Uh, a committee, a legislative body uh, is any kind of commission, committee, or board. It can, doesn't matter whether it's permanent or temporary, doesn't matter if it has authority to make decisions or if it's just advisory, however it's made, it's a committee subject to, it's a legislative body subject to the Brown Act. Then we have an exception in part two, which is when there is a body that is less than a quorum of the legislative body, made up solely of the members of the legislative body, that is an advisory committee, which is exempt from the definition of a legislative body and is not subject to the Brown Act. Um, this is what the fire district calls ad hoc committees. Ad hoc committee is not a term in the Brown Act at all. What we informally call ad hoc committees are actually advisory committees, which are not subject to the Brown Act. Hmm. Then there is an exception to the exception in part three, which says that uh, doesn't matter if it's uh, less than a quorum of the board, if this committee has either a continuing subject matter ju jurisdiction or has a fixed meeting schedule and fixed formally by the district, then that committee is a standing committee and is subject to all the Brown Act requirements, even though it may only have uh, a less than a quorum of the board. Uh, simple, though this will all be on your test uh, next class. Uh, let's, let's work through, uh, I have a few examples just to illustrate this and feel free to jump in and ask me any, any questions if you like at any time. I can't totally see everybody. I don't have the screen set up, so you'll have to, you'll have to just say something. So here's, uh, on each of these screens, you'll see above in red, the language from the Brown Act that we just walked through, and then a little hypothetical scenario at the bottom. So the first scenario is the board, you all, appoint two directors to an ad hoc committee. Remember, an ad hoc committee is what the Brown Act might consider to be an advisory committee. And the committee is to meet with interested community members to discuss recent fireworks disturbances and then report back to the board at the next meeting with recommendations. So this uh, is a classic example of a clean and simple advisory committee. It is made up of two members of the board that is less than a quorum. It does not have a continuing subject matter jurisdiction because it's only gonna be around for a month. It's reporting at the next month, nor is there any indication of a fixed schedule having been set by the board. And so this falls into that part two exception for advisory committees. And this group is not subject to any Brown Act requirements. Let's change a little wrinkle. Now we have the board appointing two directors to the same ad hoc committee for the same purpose, but now the direction from the board is to meet with community members on the first Saturday of each month and then report back to the board. So the difference here, there's only one difference, but it is a crucial difference, which is that the board by formal action has directed a fixed schedule that this committee should meet on the first Saturday of each month. And for purposes of the Brown Act, that is enough to transform this from an advisory committee that is exempt from Brown Act requirements to a standing committee that is a legislative body subject to all the Brown Act requirements. Got one, two more wrinkles. Now we have our, the board appointing two directors to an ad hoc committee. Um, does not say on the first Saturday of each month, but as it happens, the members of this committee informally between uh, each meeting does in fact decide to meet on the first Saturday of each month and that's what happens in fact. So it's exactly the same actuality as the last scenario. The only difference is that the board set the fixed schedule in one instance and in this, this instance, the committee informally just decided and that's just the way it worked out. And while it seems perhaps form over substance, that distinction in and of itself is enough to preserve this body's status as an advisory committee and would not be considered a standing committee. And my last example, I promised I would try to be brief, although hope maybe you'll have some questions and comments and we'll have a discussion. 
this is a little bit of an odd wrinkle. So at a joint meeting of the fire district and the city of Menlo Park, there is an agreement to appoint an ad hoc committee made up of the two directors and the city manager of Menlo Park. Meet and confer and report back to the board in one month. There is no continuing subject matter jurisdiction. There is no fixed schedule. The wrinkle here is that the city manager of Menlo Park has been appointed to the board, to the committee, excuse me. The exemption for advisory committees in the second part of this convoluted statutory language requires that an, an advisory committee must be composed solely of the members of the legislative body. So the presence of the city manager of Menlo Park means this may not be an advisory committee and it must be subject to Brown Act requirements. Um, so anytime there's a committee uh, that does that includes people other than board members, it by definition becomes a standing committee subject to the Brown Act. So that's my little session for the evening. I'm happy to chat about anything or answer any questions, um, but this is how I spend my day uh, parsing out situations and working my way through thorny statutory language. The Brown Act is actually quite a short piece of, of legislation, but as you just saw in that one paragraph, it's really packed with, with uh, some intricacies that require careful attention. So thanks for your time and I'll take any questions. Any questions for um, uh, Steve or Chuck? Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, Steve, um, these examples, and in no way am I quarreling with them, but I'm just curious if these precisions that you've explained to us are the result of case law or just the best interpretation around? It's a great example. So the great question. Uh, the Brown, none of these are just examples and of the law according to Steve. These are all uh, the law according either to case law or the attorney general. The most common way Brown Act questions are resolved is by opinion letters from the attorney general. These are not binding legal precedent, but they're uh, accepted and very persuasive on courts. And it's pretty rare that a court will overturn an attorney general opinion. And um, I can share with you if you like. The, there's a case on the last example. The, the others are um, all based on attorney general opinions. There's also a very helpful handbook that the attorney general has published um, uh, written by an, uh, an assistant attorney general who's the smartest guy I've ever met. He's uh, probably the state's greatest authority on the Brown Act. He happens to be blind, entirely blind, but can uh, recite you every single piece of the Brown Act backwards and forwards. Um, and I, that's also a helpful resource. Right, what I think it's helpful about this is, I mean, I, I don't want to try to make my own interpretations, but I think you've alerted us to things that if we're in a situation where one of these issues might be raised, that's the time to ask you your opinion about how we're proceeding. I encourage the question. And um, if, if this little presentation has done nothing else than to make your sort of Brown Act antennae a little more sensitive when you're walking down the aisles of the supermarket, Director Bernstein, and you see Director Jones in the fresh vegetable aisle, and you wonder, wait, if I ask him about the tomatoes, or do we just have a meeting of the Safeway committee? And uh, that's great. If that's just comes across your mind, that would be terrific. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Steve? Um, I just lost you on the Zoom, so I, I don't see any hands up. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, I can't see any, everyone because my Zoom has gone bad on me. So, um, yep, I don't think anybody had any more questions. Okay, thanks, we'll, Steve. Thanks a lot, Thank Steve. You. That was very helpful. Uh, we'll move on to our next item, uh, which is a presentation by. Uh, there was a scheduled presentation from the Bell Haven Community Center, uh, but uh, Chief, is that still um, been canceled or put on hold? Yeah, Fergus, Fergus O'Shea, I CC'd you on that email. He asked that it be rescheduled to October. Um, I know that they also are looking at some changes to the way that that uh, community center is going to be built. So that's probably all part of it. 
Okay. So they 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 play, they want to still do the presentation. It's just going to be delayed, and it's going to probably be changed a little bit. Okay. Um, thank you for that uh, consent calendar. Uh, there's one item, two items on this consent calendar. One is the um, minutes of the uh, March 9th special board meeting. Um, uh, and uh, July 21st uh, regular board meeting. Uh, and there was a um, accepted treasury report for the month in uh, ended June 30th, 2020, unaudited. I'll move so, to approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion been made and second by you, Rob? Second by yes, Rob. Sir. Yes, sir. Um, roll call, Michelle. Director Bernstein. Um, uh, we're voting on the on the motion. Yes. Okay. Well, I don't have any discussion, but I'll I'll vote uh, yes. Director Crawley. Aye. Director Solano. Yes. Director McLaughlin. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Moving to the regular uh, calendar agenda, we have one, two, three, four items. Uh, item number six is to consider for adoption a resolution authorizing the fire chief to execute a contract with uh, Cal State Construction Inc. for the fire station four and site improvement uh, in the amount of uh, 1800 uh, $1, $185,700. Uh, $77 uh, and authorize a 5% contingency for potential change orders. Um, Chief? Yeah, I wish it was only $1,800. <laughs> yeah. right? That's $185,777, I believe is right. what it is. And uh, Cal State, uh, single bid, 5% uh, contingency, very straightforward. We talked about this last month uh, as I brought up you know, the priorities for construction station four. Um, and, you know, I know Director Bernstein asked some questions. Uh, John Hitchcock did a great job of answering those very thoroughly. So if you have that document, that answers, I think, uh, any questions that hopefully anybody has. But, you know, uh, this is like I said before, and we discussed at the Strategic Planning Committee. So I don't know if they have anything they want to say, but it's very straightforward. This is one of the final last two steps in what has been an ongoing uh progress uh, for station four to rebuild that station. Um, this is to get us essentially build or not build. This is essentially to modify and establish the quarters for the crew in the house that we purchased behind the building, which was being rented is no more <clears throat> to prepare it so that it can be used as temporary quarters during the period of construction. There is a step that comes after this and the timing, I think it's all listed out in the questions that John responded to um, that ideally or hopefully um, if everything goes correctly uh, and you approve this tonight, then we should be able to break ground by the first of next year. I, I hesitate to say the end of this year, but I would more likely say the first part of next year. And in speaking with Kathy uh, last, last time about this too, this project's fully funded right now, which is the first time in building a firehouse that we would have all the funding um, necessary at the beginning of the project. So remember, that's also typically a multi-year uh, thing. So, you know, it's not as if we're going to spend all the funds right out of the gate. It's going to be done in increments to whoever the vendor is that gets selected as the general contractor. So, um, if you know John laid out the phases, John laid out the timing. Uh, he responded to the questions. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you have outside of that. But uh, the strategic planning committee recommended this come forward to the board, and uh, I think they were satisfied with what the same report had, had given them informationally. And we need this to stay on schedule and to keep on track and to move forward. Robert. Yes, Virginia. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing the fire chief to execute a contract with Cal State Construction for Station 4 in my neighborhood. Yay, yay, yay. For site improvements in the amount of $185,777 and authorize a 5% contingency for potential change orders. 
And Harold, I think this came out of the finance committee, right? Oh, about the okay, my, strategic yeah, plan. My, my yeah. bad, you're right. Yeah, finance, that's correct. So that's I'll make a motion to start the discussion if there's a second. Second. So motion been made by Virginia, second by Rob. Uh, call for the question. Oh, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no discussion. Discussion, question, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> go ahead. Discussion. Who wants to discuss? So? Yeah. Let me say, I, I, um, I, I know I, I hurt somebody's feelings by raising the questions that I raised about this, but um, uh, that's, that's what I was elected to do, and that's what I intend to do. Uh, I'm not questioning anybody's... Um, judgment on this, but for example, it was news to me that we had planning department approval. I, I don't think that was ever announced to the board that the planning department had approved our plans. Um, that, so that was news. Um, but I'm concerned that we're going ahead with a project that hasn't been approved, voted upon, or anything. I, I'm not saying it's not a priority, and I, I don't disagree with the priority, but to start a project where we don't have a price we don't know, we don't have approval. We really don't know when it would start because normally on these kinds of things, even if we're further along than I thought we were, I, I didn't think we even had preliminary uh, entitlements. But given that we do, usually once you take it out for a bid, there's a whole process that goes on with value engineering and um, changes which require change drawings and resubmission and reapprovals. I mean, it's possible that we could start this in two or three months, but I, I would be shocked if that were the case. And it seems to me that um, I, I really would like to know, and I guess what I'm being told, but I, I'm, I'm skeptical because I haven't heard it before, is that all the, uh, all the, the, the traffic issues are resolved. There's no issue about where we enter the property or where we leave the property. We're able, we know we have this big lot next door and we know that we could put something on it and not have to move it at this point, which is the Cal State construction stuff. Um, again, if we know all that, then that, that's a surprise to me, but um, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong about that. I just didn't know that we had all that, but it still seems to me that, that we're not going to start this project for at least till the beginning of the new year. And the whole project, as I, as I read the contract, and I, I read the entire thing, it's incredibly, what, 175 pages or something. Um, and then it, it took me forever to read it. But it seems like the work that they're going to do is only going to take 30 days. And the move-in time is only two weeks. And if it's only six weeks, and we don't start until January, why are we starting now? I, I guess I, I just, because I, I'm concerned that, as they say, you know, twixt the cup and the lip, uh, uh, you know, many of the slip twixt the cup and the lip. I, I mean, the, the possibility that something could change, that we get delayed, that who knows what, it just seems to me premature. So that, that's, that's, that's my feeling about this. I, I, and let me be clear. I don't have any quarrel with the amount of the money of, on it. I don't quarrel with what's being done, although I had no, it was hard for me to even read and understand what was being done. Um, I'm a little concerned that we're having to, we, we bought this stuff before when we were doing station two and uh, we shipped it up to Santa Rosa, uh, loaned it, and I haven't heard anything back about you know when we're gonna get that back and what the status of that is, but we're buying new stuff now um, our, 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 our taxpayers are buying new equipment that we already own and we loan to someone. And if, for example, I'm not trying to take anything away from Santa Rosa, but it would be nice to find out if we're gonna get that, that uh, tent or awning back. If we were, we wouldn't need to buy a new one, and things like that. So it, it, it just seems premature to me uh, at this point. There's just a lot of questions that I still have. I've raised them. So on the tent, I know that that question was you asked and answered. You're talking about a nine thousand uh, dollar uh, item, uh, and there's a photo of it in the in the questions uh, response. And we will ask Santa Rosa for that back. But remember, the board 
we opted to loan them the trailer uh, and the and the enclosure structure for the apparatus, uh, and we did that because we did not need it for station uh, six the same way because we operated out of the Hoover House. Um, that was not the case at station two, so we don't need the trailer, but we do need an enclosure. Maybe uh, remember we didn't have one at at station six, and I wish I could predict the weather. So you know. I hope it rains a lot because we need rain. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I, it could be that it is delayed for weather a little bit. And equally, I can't predict what the county is going to do. But I will say this, the county, <clears throat> maybe this is part of where there's a little confusion. Um, the county has been great to deal with, better than, certainly much better than Menlo Park by a long shot. Um, and, you know, I, I think East Palo Alto had its, its own set of challenges with staffing. I don't want to say anything bad about them, um, but, you know, the county has been really good, easy, straightforward. So things have been moving at a, a really good clip with the architect, with the individual we brought in um, to help us, as you know, because I know you thought that was a good idea, and certainly it, is, it always plays out to be. Um, and, you know, I, we're... We're right there. I, we had a community meeting at the firehouse, if you remember. It wasn't well attended, but for those that were there, some of the direct neighbors, I think we've answered all their concerns. We've been working with them. I mean, we don't make a lot of that stuff public. We try and do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and I, I've not heard any complaints or anything otherwise. So, you know, the good news is, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's been easier. Um, and yet there are complexities, like you said, to, you know, getting hopefully a good general contractor and, uh, and then also, uh, you know, having a schedule with timing so that that all gets done and finished uh, in, a, in a way in which it's more like a station six than it was on a station two, which was difficult and problematic. And I won't speak for legal counsel, but I know that Steve looked at uh, our contract has, you know, has studied a little bit, and there's some things that we're making improvements on. Um, but there's most of it, I think, looked pretty good, and, they, and he was satisfied. So, from a legality standpoint, um, I think, you know, the, at least general counsel has expressed to me that we're in good shape if we change a few things, and I think we've done that. So, you know, we're we're ready to go into at least this part, and then, like I said, we'll be back to you with the broader um, project, because that's when it's going to be, you know, the real cost and then the real vendor and the real uh, timeline that they will have to provide as well as part of the agreement. Robert? What, what is the number um, you're operating on, Chief, as the price for this? What, what's the estimate you're using? Yeah, you know, I think John and I were talking about this the other day. We're looking at about 16 or 17 is what we think. You know, and again, it, until you go to the market, that's, you'll see what that bears. But so far, um, I think it, it, we're not in a total down economy, but it has slowed down. I, so I think there's people out there who, you know, compared to where we would have been if the, there never been COVID, I would have been more worried. We were looking, we thought at about 22 uh, then. And, you know, construction is taking a hit. Uh, not everybody, but some people still building. But, you know, I think a lot of contractors would love to have this project um, because not only it keeps them going, but, you know, these are signature projects if they, you know, if they work on them. So, you know, you're looking at a couple of years uh, if you're a general to get, get stuff like this done. Uh, so, uh, we, we'll see. Jim? Uh, Jim? Sure. Were you done, Chuck? Well, I just wanted to get the chief to respond to the issue. Let's say we were delayed six months or something. As I read the contract, but it wasn't totally clear to me, it seemed like if the project's delayed, this contract would cost us more. Can, can you comment on that? Well, actually, that's why I have attorneys. So I'll let Stephen comment on that. I mean, I know they looked at the contract, and I'm not sure that's exactly what it says. But I, I think that, you know, again, you do have every contract has a number of contingency for rain dates and set, and we've always had that, right? So, you know, once you once you start, you get everybody wants some of that because that's the unknown. 
Right. Um, so there's always a level of risk, but even, you know, forget your first step, once you get these, the firefighters moved, um, which we've done many times, I think that's going to be the easiest part actually, because we've done it so many times that we're fairly good at it. But the, the part that, you know, does take some time too is demo, right? So just to clear the lot and then you got to do the underground. And so, you know, it's not as if, I mean, weather can impact some of that, but as we saw at station six, even with bad weather, you know, as long as they get a break in between and they even tarp it, you know, there's a lot of ways for them to keep working in inclement weather. So it doesn't mean it's 100% foolproof, but, you know, it, it seemed not to be a problem, um, as big a problem as I thought it could be uh, based upon, you know, what, we, what we've seen now in two projects. And some of that's just the general attitude of the contractors themselves. So, but there's always... There's always dates in there that they're going to want to negotiate for, you know, them not being put in a corner on performance um, that, you know, you need to be reasonable with too, right? Because again, they don't, nobody predict the weather. And then just sometimes things just happen that you run into. Like we did at six, we didn't expect to run into like a spring or water leak that then mean, meant that we had to dig out soil, replace it. You know, those are things you can't tell or under the ground until you, you know, you dig it up. So that, that happened to us at six. That was, that was totally, un, un, you know, unexpected. Jim? Yeah, I, I have more of a comment than a question. You know, I'm uh, a little disturbed by a remark in uh, the uh, response to uh, Chuck Bernstein's questions. You know, specifically, uh, the board typically does not micromanage the construction projects. Uh, I in no way interpret or regard Chuck's inquiries as micromanaging. I mean, when we start talking about nailing patterns or, uh, or brush strokes, I think we're into the micromanaging uh, phase. But, you know, uh, overall schedules, budgets, etc. I know I have an intense interest uh, in it. Uh, in fact, I would ask, uh, Chief, that you include uh, regular updates on, on major milestones regarding this project. We're spending $15 million uh, in order for us to exercise our oversight authority uh, as elected members of this board. Uh, we need to know uh, the major milestones. Are they being met? Is there slippage? What's the schedule? performance of contractors, et cetera. Uh, I, I don't regard any of that as micromanaging and uh, I, I for one would like and expect regular updates on such. Yeah, sure, point taken, appreciate that. And we've done that in the past too, Jim. I think Harold, you've given us reports for stations two and six. So, I mean, I don't think it'd be anything difficult, anything that would be difficult to do. I mean, you've yeah, done no, it before. We, we've actually done like even drone flights, remember on yeah. six? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that you can see the progress. And, you know, I mean, look, some of you live close by and, and others maybe not as much, but, you know, there is a point where you can physically, literally look at it and see what's going on. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I'll, don't worry. We'll make sure as always that we, you know, provide that and photos and so forth. I, I personally like all that stuff too, because I want to know where it is. But, you know, when anytime you're building a building, you have spurts where things are going to go fast. And then times where it's just going to seem like it's not moving because there's in a lot of interior work. But, and, and again, you hope you have the right contractor because that equally makes it so it doesn't have to be built, rebuilt, and built again. That's, that's happened to us too. Any other questions? Uh, Chief, I have two uh, clarifying questions, maybe comments um, in terms of process. Have, um, at this point, have you, uh, uh, is someone, uh, a project manager, have you identified someone on staff or are you looking to go outside to find a project manager? Yeah, no, so we brought, we brought a company on board that we've used before. Um, I thought we brought that to you guys in a contract. I'm uh, pretty sure that we did. So we do have that. Um, it isn't, we have a staff liaison, that's John Hitchcock. You know, that's who I rely on, you know, on some of these questions and so forth, because he's in it literally daily. Um, so that, that's, that model has worked well for us and typically on the updates to you, that's what I'll, I'll bring. And I'll, and I'll work directly with John on that too, because, you know, we have an interest obviously of getting in back in the building and, and making sure that the building is what we 
expect it to be because at the end of the day, it's not like a residential structure, although it has a residential component, it's a working structure, right? So it has to have a functional purpose. So, you know, it's the really fire stations or big garages with uh, kitchens and bedrooms and bathrooms to support, you know, a crew or crews that are going to work there. And uh, so it, it, isn't, it isn't your typical building. It is an essential service structure, which means from both a seismic and safety standpoint, you know, it needs to, it needs to have a higher than level standard too that we keep, we keep uh, abreast of. So, you know, we'll, we'll watch all of that. I mean, that, there's a lot of testing that goes on during the building too by, again, the, that vendor that's going to come in there to make sure that, you know, the, the sack amount of concrete is the right thing. The steel is correct with bracing and support. Again, it's an essential building. So it has to have a lot of that, that those checks that get done along the way. So second uh, question or comment, Chief, uh, maybe you can help me out. Maybe uh, some people probably already know this, but could you explain to me a little bit about uh, if the planning has been approved, what kind of, what's the process for, for getting that planning, uh, the, the plans approved? Yeah, so we're, you know, as, as John had answered in here, you know, where we are, we're, we're literally there. There's still some things that the county needs to do. I don't want to make it sound like it's, you know, we've crossed the finish line, but we're very close. And one thing, and I mentioned this to Virginia today, because she had asked about it. You know, one of the things that happened was the building official change. So uh, we had entitlements, so we had other things that were approved with the past building official. Um, and things that you work out, right? Because there's always those meetings and the little things. In this particular case, it was ADA, ironically. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden we were going backwards. And, and the good news is that John had kept all the notes and all the emails. And so we were able to, to deal with the new building representative from the county. And immediately all that went away because you know, there was a good paper trail of what was already accomplished, what was already agreed to through planning and building with the county. And so, you know, it, it wasn't gonna fall apart with someone's departure and somebody new coming in that maybe had a different approach. Um, you know, once we were able to verify all the things that we had already done, then they very quickly changed their posture and, and everything got approved. So, you know, we're, we're right there, Director. If you, again, if you read what we sent to Director Bernstein, because he did ask some good questions, you know, it is, it is right, right there. And, uh, you know, we're not all the way, but we think unless the county has some anomaly that occurs, um, you know, we see, we see this being able to um, break ground, like I said, first part of next year. So in terms of the, the planning process, the entitlements, uh, the, the focus on those entitlements uh, has to do with issues around traffic, uh, you know, I got assume water pressure, uh, capacity, um, you know, the whatever the calculations are on the overall um, determination of structure, um, strength and et cetera. Yeah. Uh, are there any other kind of errors that, that are pivotal in terms of uh, getting a, a fire station um, uh, approved through the planning process? Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. And I think we've, you know, again, the biggest, the biggest thing that you have is really that community meeting where, you know, they get to comment, the community gets to comment on the building. And I think as, you know, if, if you, I don't remember if you were there, but I mean, certainly I, I think a number of the directors were there. And uh, very few public comments, those that were there, few concerns. Like I said, we've kind of quietly been addressing those with the neighbors and, and what they were looking for, because you always want to keep people as happy as, as you can, especially the ones that are going to be directly impacted. You know, the, the, the best news here is, and again, the, I think the county did really, has so far been a good partner, is that, and this is the, here's the benefit of, rebuilding a firehouse where there's a firehouse. This is nothing new. It's only newer and bigger because the station is 70 years old and it had to be, it had to be modernized. So there is no major problem when you rebuild a, an existing 
uh, structure and it had what, what it, you know what its purpose was in exactly the same location. That's made this a lot easier and seems to be um, in every jurisdiction outside of, like I said, some of their own challenges. Um, what makes this easy? So you know, simply put, to your question, we're putting a firehouse where a firehouse used to be, and that's that's not a new thing. Yeah, it seemed like the major, you know, along those lines, the major issue was if it wasn't zoned appropriately, then yeah. trying to get it zoned would have been a, been a nightmare. Right, right. Well, you add in, you know, the, the, the uh, co-joining of the two properties was probably the biggest thing, right? And so that's all, yeah. that's all been done because that also t changed the, tr you know, that also changes the size of the footprint, the parking. And that's where, you know, again, some of the neighbors are concerned about lights coming in and in their windows. Then you get into fencing and trees and all the stuff that we've already worked through with them to make sure they're happy, right? Because in the end, if they want a higher fence or a certain type of fence, you know, I don't, we have never fought that with any neighbor um, because we want them to be happy, right? We want to be the good neighbor. And, you know, within reason, I mean, obviously you got to be reasonable too, but so far, again, all we've found is that the neighbors are very reasonable. They're very supportive. And, you know, we've tried to bend over backwards if needed to, to make sure we address their concerns. And we've done that. Yeah, my assumption is that you know, time is of the essence between now and typically when construction, uh, you know, work in terms of breaking ground, it's a little dicey uh, only because of the rainy season, the going into the rainy season. The beginning of the year, January, February, is the worst time to start trying to crack open the ground because you get, if it's sort of raining really hard, and, and the rainy season starts early too, around uh, in the November, beginning of December in that time period, uh, that's, a, that's a hard time to, try to go in and compact soil during when the ground is extremely wet. Uh, so if we, the earlier the better to beat that, that, that first initial phase of, of work in terms of demolition and, and compacting the ground, getting it ready to build on is, is so critical at this point. Beyond that, once that get done and once the concrete get poured, you know, everything else is about framing and you know, a lot of that can be done, uh, you know, it makes certain kind of downpours. So, uh, there's uh, any, are there any more questions that need to be um, I, 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 yeah chief I was wondering if 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 we could approve this with the idea that we would sign it once we had an approved contract with a contractor no, man, this is... so for this phase I don't you have a single bidder I don't know how that would work I think you're no, no, moving... no, no. you're misunderstanding what, what, what's you're misunderstanding me I just don't. So, well, could we could we not finalize the contract until we actually have? In other words, the board could vote tonight that the contract's acceptable and authorize you to sign it once we let the contract for the station. I I don't know how that would. I guess I'm trying to figure out why we wouldn't do the normal. We're going to contract to move into the other facility we bought so that that's all going to work and then we move to which still comes before you the the, the contract for actually rebuilding the facility i'm just concerned that something's going to change in this in 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 the things between now and the end and the work that we do now will have to be redone later that we i, I don't i don't see that when you talk about we've done this now um, twice, right? Most recently, um, and it probably the, the, the closest to this would be six, where you know there's no loss in preparing for the house to house the firefighters and the apparatus. It's going to have to do that no matter what. So this isn't as if it's not a step you don't have to make. Um, you know, the critical part here is it allows everything to be demoed at the firehouse once you get the other contract in place and things can move smoothly so i don't know what you gain from that i think i think part of what what will come up and obviously you'll want to discuss it and sounds like have you know a little bit more dialogue about it we'll obviously be prepared for that but that's that's the next phase right that's when we go to approve 
uh, the project itself and spending money and getting a general contractor and all of that. Really tonight, it's, it's your, your moving forward to be able to move the crew so that it doesn't get in the way of the, of the firehouse. All, all I, I, I guess I, 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 I'm not going to support it because it, it feels to me like we could move the crew in October, or November, and then not start the project until June. And why would we do that? It just seems silly to do that. I, 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 and if, if we have to undo something we've already done because the project changes, there's a last minute change on the part of the county, I don't know what. But it feels like we're trying to rush something to get the project done, but it's not going to speed up the project. The project's still contingent upon us getting a contractor and getting the work started. Well, and I, this whole project is only going to take 30 days. What's the big deal? Why, why rush to do something that's only going to take 30 days? Yeah, and I guess I don't see it as rushing. What I see it as, you know, we're trying to balance two things, right? Which is operationally, Quite honestly, I don't know. It doesn't really inconvenience our, our, we don't, you know, we're not trying to inconvenience the crew, but I, that's not really a factor. I'd rather get the crew moved over so that we're ready to go from there. And that way there's nothing as an impediment to the project. So, you know, and again, we've done that before, uh, both temporarily, like we've located the battalion chief at a station or the Hoover house for a year and ran a test and of course then the crew lived there for two years during the period of construction so i don't you know i don't for me the biggest thing operationally is to get the crew moved over get that set that part then is done and whatever happens with the fire station building which is now lo no longer occupied or being used then you know that's that can that can have some slip or other issues with it but you know we're trying to balance functionally keeping a fire crew in service and not having to sweat any of the details on that. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm, I'd rather, I'd rather keep that as a key element because again, it's not like remodeling your house. We have to, we have to be able to have uh, that crew 100% totally functional out of that building. And then, and then I relax a little bit because that's all been tested and all the alerting systems, everything is working. And, you know, it, maybe it's, well, I don't know how, I haven't been in that house. Maybe it's nicer than the firehouse. Could be, it's a, it works better, certainly better than a trailer. So uh, from what I hear, but uh, that's operationally, I would prefer that to happen because in that, in that sequence that then we're set. So there's no disruption in service. I, I think that's an excellent plan myself, Chief, because <clears throat> irregardless of when you, uh, if we start six months from now, that process is still going to be the same. You still have to go through what you're going through right now and moving the crew over. Uh, you know, and, and you still got to get your contract, you know, contractor lined up. So it, it's a, it's, it's always, in, uh, I think it's important to uh, uh, have a plan, have a, have a pattern of movement of, of equipment and, 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 and staff in order to get prepared for the bigger project. Because if the entitlement's already there, if the planning is already at the approval stage, it's just a matter of finding the money and the execution of the, of the contract or the, of the plan at this point. And that's what it seemed like it is for me at this point. So there is a motion, oh, excuse me, Rob, you had your hand yeah. up. Thank you, Robert. I, I just want to say, uh, Chief and Kathy, it's really great that we have the money in the account to go forward with this. Uh, I've got to say that uh, dealing with all the issues rel relative to the response for station four, it has to be basically operationally ready. Uh, there'll be quite a transition during the construction. And you know, there's a lot of factors here and since we've already done station two and station six, with station two was kind of uh, an educational and adventure experience, and that station two was an educational and adventure. Station six, it went pretty well. So, uh, Chief, uh, I've got to uh, support you and your staff on this, and. Uh, 
I think it's it's the best plan that, in order to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, can I just yes. make one quick comment? Sure, Carol, Virginia. I just want to also thank um, Kathy and actually John Hitchcock for his work on all of this. And I also want to let you know, Harold, if you talk to the county, can you just please thank them for their help as well in their supportive, um, well, they're being supportive because it, it's, it's, and I know this has been easier than working with the city of Menlo Park, especially with regard to station six and, you know, we had all, this, all the zoning issues and, you know, there were delays in East Palo Alto, but I'm not sure it had to do with their council as much as just the market at the time. But I, I agree that the plan is a good plan. It's been something that we've been d discussing for a few years now. Um, even though we didn't have a lot of, you know, people come into the community meeting, the people who were there who were very engaged. And I think that a new fire station in this neck of the woods in my area, which covers the largest geographic area in the district is gonna be an exciting thing. So, um, you know, I, going to keep my motion there and I'm sure Rob will keep a second too. So are there any comments? If not, there's a motion been made and seconded. Uh, discussions have been, have been uh, I assume if there aren't any other discussion on this issue that are call for the a roll call vote. Uh, Director Jones, I, did you want to ask for any public comment? Oh, thank you, Michelle. That was one of the things we were supposed to do, right, Steve? Yes, are there any public comments on this? And uh, we have no raised hands, no, no public comments. Thank you. Okay, since no, there are no um, uh, uh, comments, I uh, call for a roll call vote, Michelle. Dr. Bernstein? Uh, I'll vote no, and I'd like to have my reason uh, reflected in the minutes, uh, depending on the outcome of this. Dr. Crawley? Aye. Dr. Solano? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Jones? Yes, aye. So there's- um, Could uh, I have a minute to reflect, please, uh, Michelle, that I'm voting no because I, I, I have no quarrel with the project, but I think it's premature given that we do not have an approved project at this time. I will do that. Thank you. Uh, so we're moving now on to item number uh seven uh on the regular uh, board agenda to consider an adoption a re adoption uh of a resolution approving uh permit fee waiver for uh four hundred and three dollars each for 50 residential solar permit fees for 2021 according to the board according with the board fee uh waiver policy so um, we'll so moved. Um, motion's been made uh, by Rob to- I'll second. And second by Virginia. Call for discussion. I have one comment, Chief, if I may, or just a- Yeah, so deep, Fire Marshal Johnson, I believe, maybe on the call too, because this is- Yes, I'm on here. There you okay. go. John can answer questions better than I can on this one. Okay. It's, it's, it should be a very quick uh, minor question. Uh, I noticed that the, the, the organization is a nonprofit because I think they came last year to us well asking for the fee waiver. Um, yes, they've come and, several and, times. Yeah. And so um, my it, said, it says that are all, of the, all 50 units are going to be for uh, affordable uh, or low income individuals or? Correct, they are for uh, homeowners and they work with the underprivileged uh, or low income homeowners to help uh, with be able to reduce those costs. So they typically uh, are installing in East Palo Alto, uh, North Fair Oaks and in the Bellhaven neighborhood is the majority of their installs. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. So a motion been made, uh, seconded, uh, call for the discussion. There are no discussion on it. I call for a roll call vote. Um, well, what, are there any public comments on this? Oh, thank you, Virginia. <laughs> public comments? There are no public comments. No public comments. Thank you, Virginia. So roll call. Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director Solano? 
Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Moving on to item number uh, eight, which is to consider and approve a resolution amending the conflict of interest code. Um, Chief? Yeah, actually I'll let uh, uh, Steve take this one because I know that he looked at it and is trying, you know, we tried to align, align this. So uh, he's the one that kind of discovered it. So I'll let uh, our council take it. Sure, um, I don't wanna steal Michelle's thunder. Michelle, if you wanted to present this, that's fine too. It's, uh, there's nothing to discover. Oh. Um, I'll get started and you correct me when, when I go astray, Michelle. It's um, all yours, Steve. So uh, <coughs> this is a relatively routine item. Um, every two years and even numbered years, the board is required to take a look at its conflict of interest code and suggest any revisions that are deemed necessary. Um, there are a number of categories in which one could make changes. In this particular case, there was not a need to change any of the job classifications to which the conflict of interest of code applies. But um, it did seem to us and with Michelle's concurrence uh, beneficial to the clarity of the document to update language regarding um, the applicability of the code to consultants and any new positions that might happen over the course of the next two years. Um, and then we also wanted to include a reference to the fact that under government code section 87200, um, and incidentally in the staff report, there's an error that's probably on, my, on me. It says 87299, it should be 87200. There are uh, at the district, including in this room, uh, folks who manage the district's investments who are subject to uh, conflict of interest requirements, regardless of what is in this code. So that's clarified. The third uh, and fourth new revisions are to, I think, greatly simplify the disclosure categories that apply to line them up in a more flexible way with both the code and the district's, the reality of the district's uh, practices. So I view this as a, a relatively routine piece of housekeeping, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Yes, uh, uh, Rob. Yeah, thank you. Stephen, we have uh, representatives that sit on some of our committees. And uh, presently, there isn't a provision for those individuals to fill out the 700 form. Uh, is there a way that even though they don't have any voting power or any uh, they are sitting on that committee in an advisory role. Should we include them in the 700 form uh, reporting? So thanks for the question. This does come up from time to time. Um, there is not a, a black letter answer, but I think the answer you'll get from most practitioners and the one you'll get from me is that for the most part, public members of advisory uh, of committees, even though they may be standing committees, but that do not manage money in particular, are probably not form 700 filers. The gray area may be in a committee like a finance committee, right. where uh, a member of a finance, a public member of a finance committee uh, in an abundance of caution, I think I usually recommend that those folks become uh, form 700 filers if they are full voting members of the committee. But if they are, as I believe to be the case here at the fire district, they are non-voting members. Um, I don't have uh, a concern about them not being form 700 filers. So along that Thank line, you. Thank you. Along those lines, see what what does what does a voting um, member look like? I mean, in terms of. All in, it, it seemed like I want to make clear that words matter sometimes, and I know there's a term that's used uh, in our in our group that I've heard before, uh, a word like "do you concur?" Is that is that considered yeah. voting, or is that something different? 
Or is that um, relevant at all? No, it's really, it's a fine question. I, it's hard to answer in general. Um, uh, you know, if you have a committee that has a purely advisory role and there is not a vote where someone just has to say, I concur, I, I don't know. I suppose it would depend on the circumstances. I could imagine a situation in which two people vote and one person says, I concur. That sounds an awful like, a lot like that person voted. Um, I suppose it would depend. But I, I do, uh, uh, on behalf of the district, to, to get, uh, bring this to the issue of the conflict of interest code, I have very low levels of heartburn as to whether a member, even of the public member, even of the finance committee in an advisory role does not file a form 700. Ultimately it is in many respects, you know, that person can decide to file a form 700 and I don't think the district would, <coughs> would you know, block the door and not let them submit that form. Well, so Robert, I, um, that's a good question. But so Steve, I think with regard to the finance committee, we do have a member of the public who's on there and um, it is a standing committee. So it meets those two, you know, Brown Act requirements. And the I concur part, I think, you know, makes some sense, you know, where you think that it's not necessary for a form 700 filing, but do you think a better test would be like if the, if one of the member, I mean, one of the members isn't able to meet, the committee won't meet. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not like this person, the public member has voting power per se. I, I mean, if, yeah. if two of us aren't going to be able to make it, it's usually the meeting doesn't happen, right? Well, that's a good point. You know, I'm new to the district. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a stranger to the ways of your finance right. committee. So it's a little hard for me to answer your question in particular. Um, but uh, uh, I, I do think there is a difference President Jones from actually voting and just letting folks know that you're, you, you agree with the decision, even though your vote may not carry any weight in terms of the recommendation that the committee brings back to the board on. So I continue to think that that member of the public does not necessarily by definition have to be a form 700 pilot. But let I acknowledge me, that it's a little bit of a gray area for that particular position. Let me, let me throw it a, turn turn it this way a little bit um what if you take into consideration that you have you have two two members of the board agree and then and the third person say uh i concur the, the, you, in that scenario no 700 form would be needed the board members have agreed and the you know you you just say hey okay i, I just concur but what if there's a split decision on on the vote, and 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 this person then is turned to and asks your opinion, their opinion on it. They decide to go one way or the other way. Do they concur with one direction, or do they may concur to go? the other direction, is that then a, a form of voting and, and, and moving decisions based upon the way that person uh, decided to concur with? Or is that just a moot point? Um, the way you describe it uh, sort of implies the answer, I think, um, that one could probably reasonable people could, di di could differ about what that was. And some people might think that as a form of voting. Uh, I wanna be very careful not to you know, issue a binding opinion that a, a public sure. member of your finance committee must be a form 700 filer because I really don't believe that is the case. I think what you're talking about a little bit more is just the structure of, the of a committee with a public member and how, what does it mean to be a non-voting member? And I think that is, a legitimate question, but I'm not sure that that is the determinative factor in whether or not that person should be subject to your conflict of interest code or not. I think that is a question having to do with the, the governance of the committee and how it conducts its business would be my answer to your question. And if you, if you have a rule, as you do, that a public member is a non-voting member, perhaps it's more appropriate for that public member to uh, 
exercise a little more discretion than the example that you just gave. That's the best I think I can do for my answer to you. Okay. All right. Are, are, they, are there any other questions for uh, Steve at this point in time? No, but we need to, you want us to adopt the um, Resolution. The amending of the conflict of interest code, which I think Michelle, did you? I'm not sure. Is that on the screen yet? It, I think everybody had a chance to read it. So at this point, yes. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So technically, you would be you would be amending the code. You're not. It's not yet adopted until the county gives it the seal of approval. Oh, sorry. What did I say? I was reading off of the actual agenda. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, to adopt a resolution amending the code. That's a fine motion. Yeah, that's okay. I thought I said that, but I didn't, obviously. That um, I'll move that the board adopt a resolution amending the conflict of interest code. Motion been made. Is there a second? Second. Rob second it. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Uh, a motion has been made, uh, been seconded. Uh, no discussions. Call for roll call vote. Michelle? Would you, are there oh, public opinion, public uh, comments first before we vote? Thank you. Yeah, we have not received any public comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, roll call, Michelle? Director Bernstein? Hi. Director Crawley? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. And Director Jones? Aye. Motion to carry. Um, so we move on to item number nine. Um, consider and approve capital improvement project option discussed with the strategic planning committee. I think, we, Chief, uh, I think we kind of talked about that somewhere. Yeah, I got my committee wrong on number one, but I, I, I'll i get it right this time. So yeah, this was uh, discussed with the Strategic Planning Committee. Basically, uh, what we used was we tried to use the study, um, space needs study, and then I had the staff take a look at it. Uh, we talked about what we could do get done in this, this calendar, or excuse me, this fiscal year. Um, when I brought this up last time, the board said, let's bring it back to committee so there can be more discussion. Um, I'll walk you through, I think, just the summation of what occurred, because I tried to capture that in here. Um, obviously, number one was station four. We've, we've discussed that, so I don't need know that I need to do anything uh, else there. And then uh, priority two, which was station 77, and finishing the residential um, structure next door but the fire station itself to add another bedroom since firefighters were doubled up in that facility uh, if you go down the page there you see bolded uh, the strategic planning committee recommendation was to move forward with the expansion and remodel and temporary relocation of the two firefighters into the house next door on chilco uh, was what we agreed to uh, if you go to the next page, which is page three of six, uh, the committee did not agree with finishing the Choco house. So the fire station was approved essentially to, uh, we'll have to go for bed and to remodel it to allow to us to add another bedroom and do what's necessary there. So that was approved um, and then Priority three was modify fleet services building to accommodate aerial ladder trucks, uh, which is again at fire station 77, the shop there, the existing shop. Strategic planning committee recommendation was move forward with extending the existing two enclosed apparatus bays so the facility can support secured indoor storage or repair of larger aerial apparatus trucks. Reuse the roll up doors and other doors to make sure interior HVAC is adequate. So, you know, again, uh, extending that that shop so that it can it can accommodate the largest pieces of equipment and do so safely uh, indoors for the 
the security of the equipment, the apparatus, and then also the weather related issues for the mechanics who would work on them. Um, priority number four, fire admin, upgrade the fire prevention counter and move the conference room to the front of the building was what was proposed. Uh, again, we split this one down there, which is the strategic planning committee recommended that the modifications of the front entry and public service counter uh, be approved and it moved forward, but that the relocation of the conference room not be approved at this time. Item number five, um, which was the warehouse and the previously uh, proposed security package, which included lighting and the gate. And uh, the, the strategic planning committee uh, recommended that uh, we move forward with the front security gate uh, we attempt to use a combination solar and battery powered unit instead of a hardwired unit and that the exterior lighting was not approved at this time. So the gate is approved. I was trying to make the gate so that we don't have to bring power to it uh, by using things like solar and battery uh, power to do that. Priority six, move forward with the accessory structure and additional parking at fire station three. Strategic planning committee recommendation this project was approved by the committee to move forward. So the ancillary building on the flag lot, making the parking area larger, all those things necessary to have the secondary storage uh, on that site per what was already established with the town of Atherton as uh, the proper and allowable square footage. And finally, priority number seven, uh, station one campus, more discussion and planning was needed. And uh, the Strategic Planning Committee agreed with that. Uh, the recommendation was focus on priorities one through six. Uh, revisit this priority during the mid-year, which would be you know, the December timeframe, fiscal review, or after Fire Station 4 had been approved and was in progress. I mean, essentially, we're, we're trying to take on two stations at one time would be probably difficult the thought was get station four going and then come back and revisit this project and have more dialogue and discussion about how it could be done and then in what what order or priority and at what cost and so forth but you know get 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 fo focus on station four first and then come back and revisit this uh, at the end of the year or the beginning of next year and that's that's what the committee uh, and myself came up with. I have two committee members here. They can speak for themselves. I don't need to speak for them. I hope I captured everything fairly accurately. So, thank you, Diz, Chief uh, Jim. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, uh, I do. With regard to priority number five, uh, the security improvements at the warehouse. Uh, when that first uh, was presented to the board, I believe it had a price tag of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars which i know i regard it as as exorbitant and uh you know the chief has made a compelling argument for a, an electric gate but uh you know my my position in the, the committee and i'm not sure it's captured in in this agenda item uh and, and correct me if i'm wrong chief but there's a large uh price difference between trenching a hard wire uh, electrical source to the gate versus a uh, some kind of solar battery operated uh, unit. Yeah, we believe that's that's I think that's a fair statement because anytime you're going to have to run a uh, wire, whether it's conduit or underground, it's going to be more expensive. And that's that gate is at the far side of the property, so to do that um, is a lot of undergrounding, which is why it was a good suggestion to go with a battery and solar panel, uh, if that couldn't be done, which actually we believe it can be done, uh, then we would look at hard wiring. But yeah, the, I'm sure the price differential is gonna be astronomical. Well, I, I would like to see this uh, presented in, in, that, um, in that vein then, that uh, the goal will be to re reduce cost by doing a solar battery powered operation. And if we have to revert to uh, trenching and whatnot, uh, that before that's approved, that we know what that cost is. Absolutely. If the if the minutes could reflect that, um, I'd appreciate it. Well, 
Um, yes, uh, Rob. No, thank you, Robert. I Could Michelle go over the items that were approved and the items that were not approved so we can make a motion on this? I'm sorry, what do you want me to pull up? Well, <laughs> Chief, uh, I wrote what? these numbers down, but I want to make sure that I have them right here. Yeah, you want, me to su you want me to summarize it? I could do it. Well, yeah, if you could summarize the uh, recommendations from the Strategic Planning Commission uh, uh, Committee, and then, of course, what was not uh, approved to go okay. forward, and I'd like to make a motion on that. Okay, so in summary, uh, we, we're not dealing with priority one because we did that. That's Fire Station 4, so you can take that off the list. Um, for Fire Station 77, what is approved is to add on to the existing fire station so that we have five bedrooms for firefighters and not four. Um, and then uh, we can move the crew over to the Choco House, but we're not going to do any work currently in the Choco House. And then what was also approved at Station 77 is to increase the size of the shop to accommodate ladder trucks. Um, that's number two. Number three is, well, that was actually two and three because fleet services as well. Number four, fire admin approved was to modify uh, the front uh, customer counter so that it's both security and COVID compliant, but the conference, moving the conference room was not approved. Number five. Number five is <clears throat> the warehouse. The gate. The gate was solar, and a battery backup was approved. As Director McLaughlin, they clarified, um, we're trying not to run power all the way out there because that we think that would be extremely expensive. And the lighting, the lighting was not approved. Number six. Um, station three, that entire project, uh, adding the ancillary structure, the parking and so forth was approved. Number seven, I guess the best way to describe seven is station one is it's, uh, no, really no further discussion at this time until the end of the year. And, and we get, we get four going. So it's, it's pending. Okay. Chief, is it fair to say that the summary you just described is what is set forth in the staff report as the Strategic Planning Committee recommendations? Correct. Yes. So, Director I, I, Solano, perhaps if you're, I saw you feverishly writing and trying to formulate a motion, the motion could be to approve those items recommended by the Strategic Planning Committee as set forth in the report. Well, I, I was going through my checklist and when I went up to the gate, there's also another option, Chief, that maybe we want to look at. And it's kind of cell phone technology using a, a wireless intercept to open that gate, too, where we don't... Like which gate, Rob? The, involving the gate uh, in, install. There, it's not only solar, but there could be... Uh, another option too. I don't know if it'll be cheaper or not, but you can use an 80211 or a wireless interface in, in order to open that gate too. Right. Yeah, I'm aware of those that we we um, yeah. we get those on calls, and uh, actually dispatch can actually open some of those gates too. There you go. That's what I was. Yeah, that's another option for us. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Stephen. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Oh no, Rob, are you done? So for, um, I think it's number two, I keep trying to get back to my screen and it's regarding the Chilco house and the lack of not doing anything on the outside. Is there a reason for that? I mean, it seems to me that's like such a minor thing, number one, and number two, I know that a couple of the city council members who represent people um, 
in the well, well it, actually in that in that in those areas I have made comments about this and it just I don't know. I mean, what was the rationale? Because it's two hundred thousand dollars, or I mean, I don't. I don't think we really focused on a rationale. I mean, I think what we were trying to get to is what was what would be approved and what would not be approved. So I don't know. No, I, under, I understand that. I, I just I, we've I heard from the city about the what they what some of the council members have defined as blight for that house which is our property and i'm just curious it's not a new issue but um you know i think it could be seen as an equity issue too so i don't know i just i mean i understand it's we don't own the property next door but we have a 55 year lease i mean the whole thing right i i just to me i just don't understand why we just don't make the house it's a public it's public property, you know, look nice. It's our property. It's the taxpayer's property too. I mean, I, I don't know. I wasn't in the meeting, so maybe I'm missing something here. And I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I just am curious. Um, Jim, you got a comment on that? I yeah, I, I would just comment that uh, the board still do, the board uh, to date does not have an approved uh, uh, use policy on on that house. I mean, it, when it was initially purchased, one of the alternatives was to put the bolts over to it, and uh, we haven't uh, we haven't had that discussion. We haven't made uh, that policy. So to spend additional money without, and again, I'm just, I'm expressing my view. Uh, not necessarily what was discussed in the strategic planning committee meeting. Uh, I, until we have an adopted uh, policy, I, I think it'd be premature to spend any additional money on the house. My thoughts is, uh, on that is, um, I'm pretty much like you, Virginia, I, th I think the, it, uh, those areas that where we could spend money that that would not give the impression that that a poor man lives in the house. I, I think we could we could have the district can afford it. Um, whether the bucket of paint or throwing some rocks in the, in the driveway to kind of give it appearance that other than what it is, uh, and those are not not that costly. So, but you, and Jim is right that we, we really don't have a housing a policy around housing and housing related stuff. And as a result, that's, that's where we, 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 where we are in terms of going full blown to try to improve the area like we did Atherton when we first bought that house. It was, it was a mess in and of itself. And, and we went in and took care of it. I think Chuck, you and Rob remember that time where, where we had to go in and get that thing fixed because they had an outrage from, from the people there. And, you know, and so it, it's the same thing here. And, and I think the quicker we can move to 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 get that policy, as, as Jim mentioned, I, I think that the better off we'll, we'll be, um, because clearly it, it serves a, a particular need that is in the that's in the best interest of the fire system, our firefighters, uh, and, and our operation uh, by structuring it, the house. To, to accommodate, you know, um, people living in it, uh, uh, in particular the battalion chief. So, but we haven't had that conversation yet. So, so, you know, let's do what we can and do, keep keep planning for the other. Rob, Robert, I like that. Uh, Robert, that's an excellent point. Uh, you know, if it involves a maintenance issue, you know, I think that there's as you mentioned with the with the policy aspect, is if is that re residence a maintenance issue, or is it a public works or facility project? And we really don't really have a defined policy or procedure relative to that. And I think that's something that we need to explore further. Well, that's on the uh, from not out of place. I think that's on 
the strategic planning list of things right. to, to look at so mm -hmm. or to begin the ball rolling so you guys have have charge of a, of a lot of things right jim <laughs> but we're trying to we're trying to tackle them one at a time so <laughs> any other comments robert i have some who's that chuck yeah, yeah. Oh, okay um one is a question about what it is that we would be approving tonight. What, what number nine says is consider and approve capital improvement project options discussed. Are we approving a priority list? Are we approving expenditures? Um, will these projects still come, still come back to us for approval of the actual projects? I, I'm not sure what 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 we're actually approving tonight or proposed to approve. I think if you're asking me, uh, I, I'm just going by what we uh, it says to consider and approve capital improvement project options discussed well, with the strategic planning committee commission. So well, actually, is which, it that or is it focus on priorities one through six and revisit priority seven during the mid-year fiscal? I mean, that's fiscal review or after fire station four has been approved or is in, and is in progress. That's what the strategic planning committee recommendation is, right. is to what, focus on priorities one through six. What? So it's a, the, what we're focusing on is priorities. We're not approving expenditures at this point. Is that correct? Well, I, I don't know, Chuck. It's a good question because it sounds like it may be both. You're going to need, so the next step, things have to come back to you because these are all cost estimates, and so we would need to get bids. And within all of that, you know, then things will have to come back because, um, you know, we would probably bid some of these together, some independent. But in all cases, you know, these items will come back, at least to the committee, if not to the full board, for approval. Because, uh, you know, again, cost estimates aren't actuality. But priority is to get these some of these things moving because right. they have not been moving so right so basically we're voting on the priorities it sounds like right so that y'all can get things going so we can get the bids and all of that going correct okay. so okay i want to ask a second question though the chief um i'm not I, i'm truly not taking i'm not quarreling with any of this but i'm a little concerned about this notion of making things COVID-19 safe and what that implies. That implies, I, I mean, that relates both to the living quarters for the firefighters and it also relates to the lobby uh, of, of the admin building. Um, have we gotten any kind of um, design advice um, about what is considered safe um, are we using specified distances? Are we using some sort of shields? What, what is it? And I'm a little concerned even about the Choco house because as, as I understand, Choco house is one bedroom. It's got one little kitchen. I mean, that house isn't safe for more than probably at most two people in, in the traditional definition of safe. And I, I just, I'm curious about our liability on this and, um, you know, I, I, I'm just trying to understand what the risks are here and how we could even, how we could even begin to make these things, you know, given the kind of ventilation system that's in there or not only there, but even in our other stations. I, I just like your thoughts about the COVID-19 and if we've gotten any professional advice on this and, and uh, what we're promising the firefighters in terms of safety. Yeah, and professional advice, I don't know that, you know, I mean, this is all new. I think what we're trying to do is we, we look into things and then ask for assistance and help. But, you know, you have two people living in a bedroom, that's not conducive. They're, you know, their distancing isn't, isn't there. No other, no other station has two people living in their own, in their own bedroom. So that's, that's a problem. Uh, the Chico House has two bedrooms, so that's a good fallback there because you can separate them. It's better than the conditions that they're currently in. You know, it's not ideal because they're next door, but one way they're next door, so they're close. So there's, you know, it's close enough, right, to make it work during the period of construction. Um, on the on the uh, front counter, it's not just COVID; it's security. 
And, you know, I know you had mentioned earlier about like Friday. Well, this is one of those things where, you know, the, our, our existing, forget COVID for a second, our existing ability with the way the original prevention counter was designed, it was never with security in mind, meaning protection of the employees that are there. So we realized we needed to do a better job there anyway, if we wanted to be able to open up for five days where not as many people were around and anybody who would work there would feel safe that if somebody came in, you know, there was enough barrier between them and the customer in case something, you know, was to go down. Um, so it's probably going to look a lot more like a police counter than it would look like an open uh, setup that we have now because it's not, it, again, it wasn't designed with that in mind. Um, in terms of COVID, you're exactly right with screens and other things that are there now. I think there's a lot more knowledge about what what can be done, including you know how many people can be in the lobby, you know how many people can be outside if you need that to happen, and so forth. So there's you know that's what we'll we'll get some professional advice on the design. Um, simply because obviously contamination and the ability of someone to get contaminated will be a, a focal point of um, whatever we're going to put in there. And so, you know, we're not experts in that, but uh, we'll certainly talk to people about, you know, what's best practice. And have you been exploring like the filters that are being used in the air conditioning system and that kind of stuff? Yeah, we've heard about that. I mean, HVAC for, you know, we have, you know, like my office right now, I have my own individual unit. So it isn't, it isn't ducting that goes through the building. So certainly, you know, those, those, and those are, you know, sometimes more expensive, but um, and sometimes less, but at the end of the day, those are things I think to what you're, you're bringing up that you can look at and say, you know, you're not going to have cross contamination that way. Okay. Well, okay. Good. I, I, mean, I, I think it's something that we, we need to look at. We need to be careful not to be promising that it's, that it's uh, safe because I don't Yeah, that's a, you know, again, those are relative words, but I mean, having two people in the same room sleeping together that, you know, is, it was a room that was never designed for two people. Yeah, that, that we need to fix. And we'll fix that right away, you know. And can you tell me, one last thing is about the location of the, of the rescue. I'm not sure, because it's moved around and it was part of the pandemic response and now it's not. Right. Is the rescue at Station 77 now? Yeah, the rescue is back at Station 77, has been for a while. Um, you know, we, we occasionally will move it to different places. We just did it for six for the red flag warning that we had in the county. And part of that was just to get it, put it in the middle of the district. Um, so yeah, there's options always that we have there because we know it, it also works at station six, but 77, because of all the different things that we have going on out there, um, you know, we still have the water rescue program. We still have the training center. We still have the urban search and rescue program. So they equally, you know, help with that. I know they were out of service today doing water rescue training out in the bay. So, you know, again, there is a, there is a benefit to having that unit. And that's, that unit has had a lot more calls with all the encampment fires that we're talking about. That's one of the few pump and roll uh, units that we have. So it's in the summer, it's a good, it's a good thing having it over on that side of the freeway where we have many more uh, vegetation fires, whether it's in East Palo Alto on the levees or it's in the triangle or what have you. It gets, it gets used a lot more there. And how many pieces now do we have at station at station two? And what's, what's the firefighter count there versus the bedroom count? Yeah, so we have 10 bedrooms. Uh, we have a total, I'm, I'm sorry, 12 bedrooms. We have a total currently of three on the engine, four in the truck, and the battalion chief. Uh, the units there is an engine, a truck, a heavy rescue, and battalion chief. So the heavy rescue is cross-staffed by the uh, truck crew as needed. So we have the train, uh, the guy underneath the train, the heavy rescue was brought by the truck crew who switched over and brought it to that call. Well, how many firefighters is that? Is that 10 or 11? No, so we have four in the truck, three in the engine, seven, and then a battalion chief is out of there currently. So that's eight total. I see. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Are there any other comments for the chief? No, but can Michelle, Michelle, could you please read the motion again? I didn't have a motion. There was a recommendation on a motion from Steve, but nobody made a motion. And I oh. think Director Solano has stepped away. Okay, I thought he made the motion. Just to be clear, I'm not recommending a particular motion. I'm just was right. offering a suggestion for purposes right. of clarity. That's what I meant to say. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, no that's okay. okay. So, is there a motion on item uh, to accept the recommendations made within the that were discussed and came out of the uh, strategic planning committee? Uh, well, I mean, I'll make the motion to go with the strategic planning committee's recommendation to focus on priorities one through six and revisit priority seven during the mid-year fiscal review or after fire station four has been approved and is in progress. I'll second that. So a motion been made uh, 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 by Virginia, second by Jim, call for discussion. Uh, hearing right. none, uh, a call for a roll call. Are oh, there any public comments? We have no public comment. No public, public comment at this time. We'll call for a roll call vote. Michelle? Uh, Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Crowley? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. And Director Jones? Aye. Motion carries. Um, thank you. We're moving on to item number. Um, hmm. Let's see, where are we? I'll change the screen in just one moment. Uh, item number 10 on the proposed agenda item. It was an item from uh, Director Bernstein requesting uh, a discussion on the chief officers and management and confidential employees compensation plan uh, as a future item on the board agenda. Chuck? Well, I recommended that we discuss this because it had come up um, during the discussions of our AFSCME contract and um, AFSCME employees perhaps feeling that they were being picked on compared to our other employees. So it seemed to me that it was correct that we ought to have the discussion for all employees. Um, however, given that these are bargaining units and these are subject to negotiations and not all of them are, the, the, uh, some of them are just simply plans. It seems to me that uh, this should more appropriately be held in, in closed session, but I think to put it on a closed session agenda, we have to bring it up in a public session to have it approved for a closed session. So I, I'd like to move that we put this on a closed session agenda. Um, and I, I think we'll need a, some sort of uh, opinion from our, our council here because I may not be correct about it being able to be on a closed session agenda. So thanks for your sensitivity to that issue. Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand the issue that you're hoping to discuss. So I, I wonder um, if it is something that you would like this board to consider, regardless of whether it is open or closed, but you have a preference, the board just could consider your item and it could be uh, it's just subject to our further discussions. If it hinges on whether it's open or closed, I think I need to explain a little bit more about the closed session exemptions and we could discuss together whether one applies and uh, we could do that either during this meeting or offline. I, I first, I'd like to have it no matter what, but I, I foresee a discussion. Um, it, it seems to me that it involves three, three units here. One is a unionized unit, that is the firefighters and what we might do in the future with respect to their contract. Um, secondly, it would include the chief officers, which is not a negotiated thing, but a, simply a plan. Um, and the third is with the confidential management employees. Uh, so it, those three groups. Okay, so my, my general reaction to you is that the Brown Act is, um, is very wary and looks askance at closed sessions, um, issues of compensation that are not 
linked to a specific individual or a specific bargaining unit in terms of labor negotiations. And so to discuss generally the district's policies regarding various compensation plans for groups of people, as you just indicated, would not be something that is eligible for a closed session discussion. Well, I, I, I'd like to bring it up that we should discuss it and I, I'm, I'm happy to let you discuss this further with the chief and what the appropriate venue is. Well, I appreciate it. That sounds great. So the board could just consider your request as they ordinarily would and we can agendize it as is appropriate at the time. Any other discussion on items? Uh, Jim, Rob, Virginia? Yeah, as far, far as I'm concerned, I, I'm not sure what the point would be. I, I know this item came up during uh, last month, I think, conversation that we was going through with the ASME contract in terms of uh, providing, uh, as, uh, 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 you know, getting this, this, this uh, extension of time uh, and, and before coming back around to ask me in December or January, that if my recollection was, was clear, it could be foggy too, that <clears throat> this item of compensation came up uh, and, and the question of, of not being able to vote on, on what got passed, approved uh, uh, and, and supported by uh, our, the uh, Acne, acne at that today was around looking at the you know, overall district plan in terms of uh, financial plan. And I think that's that's where this conversation came up uh, in exploration. I'm not sure. You know, we, we haven't scheduled another meeting between now and then and begin to explore for the second round of potential conversation we will have with with that with the group, with the, the, the union group. So um, this, this can feed into that, that discussion, but why we need to talk about it now, I'm not clear, not quite clear why now versus putting it in the, in the, in the conversation as we move uh, closer to having this, this, this discussion with our active group. Jim? You know, <clears throat> uh, a question. Uh, for, uh, for the chief, uh, our non-represented employees, uh, do they have a scheduled pay increase in, uh, uh, in January or, or any other month coming up? Yeah, that's correct. So they have compensation plans. They're not a bargaining group, meaning they're not union, uh, unionized. And so those comp plans uh, are written in a way in which it clearly specifies what their compensation will be, which is what people like to see so they know what it is. But as you kind of alluded to, um, but that, that's in control of the board. There, it's, not as if, um, it's not as if the board doesn't have any latitude there. Uh, they, were, they were set in place for three years. I believe this is the last of the three years. Um, but, you know, again, those, those are things that based upon economics and other things that the board, if it chose to do more or less, uh, it can do that. And uh, again, they're not like a union. And I know that was brought up during the discussions regarding Ask Me as, as uh, Director Bernstein had mentioned, but you know, every group is different. Now, I was not aware that we were gonna talk about the firefighters union, because that's much further out. Yeah, but that is, so that is a little bit different when you're going to start talking about a labor group that's unionized. Um, that, I think that might be worth a little bit more discussion about what are we trying to do, and I'm sure certain they'll take interest in that as well. Oh, right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, my, my thoughts on this topic, you know, this, this did come up uh, during our discussions of the AFSCME uh, uh, contract, and I, I think uh, I think it's timely if uh, there are scheduled pay increases for uh, for January. Uh, you know, we're in mid-August, so uh, I, I do think it's timely. I, I would I would much prefer to have these discussions in a closed session, 
but again, I, I will defer to uh, our council's uh, advice on the topic. But if, if, there, if, if it's legally permissible, uh, I would favor that. But I, I, I do think it's timely and, and uh, I would support Chuck's uh, proposal. That's all I have. Any other comments? Anything else you want, need to, want to say, Chuck? Uh, no. I think Rob had a comment. Rob? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, as to this, the contract for, for those, re those individuals are the end of this year, Robert? Stephen, or Chief, does this? No, that's going to be, so you're talking about compensation plans for unrepresented confidential and chief officers are January of next year. January of next year. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Are there any other comments, Virginia? If not, then we uh, we need to entertain a motion to place this on a future board meeting uh, agenda for next month. I'd like to make that motion that we put this topic on uh, agenda in whatever venue is deemed appropriate uh, by our general counsel. I'll second that. Uh, motion been made and it's been seconded by Jim. Uh, call for any discussion. Roll call vote, Michelle. Um, uh, public comment. Thank you. There, there, there are no public comments. No public comment. Okay. Roll call vote. Director Bernstein. Aye. Director Crawley. Aye. Director Solano. Aye. Director McLaughlin. Aye. Director Jones. Sustain. Uh, sustain. Yeah. Abstain. 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 <laughs> Abstain. So moving on to item number uh, reports uh, and requests. Um, so we got um, uh, any report from the Human Resource Committee? No. Uh, they, they, we didn't, I don't think we met, we didn't meet this time. Okay, no report. Uh, EPREP? Yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, we met, uh, we uh, discussed the strategies for moving forward with the CERT program. Uh, we, we have a little bit of a, 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 something that I think should be brought in front of the entire board for discussion. And one's involving uh, the staff report that uh, Ryan had presented to us for discussion purposes involving the volunteer programs within our district. It, it looks like we're in kind of a, somewhat of a impasse in a building block segment involving our emergency prep support. And what I'd like to do is, if I could, and I'll, I'll give you a call, Robert, and we can discuss how you want this, if you do want this on the uh, full board, or if you just want it to go back to our emergency prep committee. We have a multitude of volunteer groups uh, one of which is going forward with quite a few projects and needs financial assistance or support. We have an established group that is working with a public safety agency within our fire district. 
that is functional with that public safety group. So, and then we have some other volunteer groups that are very eager to work in these volunteer situations. So what I'd like to do is bring a discussion in front of the board to see if the CCM concept is an agreeable workable concept the way it is now, or if we should use the fire district and the group that Ryan has established presently with Andreas uh, to filter a lot of these financial requests that go through all the volunteer groups within our community. We spoke about a grant form, boilerplate form, where these groups could individually request funding to the fire district. Uh, some of the questions that I posed to the chief were, uh, does it have to be a nonprofit to order to get funds? Uh, can it be an LLC? Does it have to be sponsored by a government agency? Uh, so those were a lot of questions that, that we discussed. Uh, will, will CCM be a, uh, a nexus for training for equipment issue uh, to assist all these other volunteer groups? Or will it be a filter for all the volunteer groups to come to the fire district for either financial or training support or equipment support? So I think this may be something that, that maybe the entire board wants to get into, or Robert, if you want us to continue working within our group that, that Chuck and I are doing, you know, that's fine too, but uh, what do you think? <laughs> Rob, Robert, um, through the Virginia? chair. Yeah. Hey, Rob, I think that you're bringing up a really good thing. And so are you thinking that maybe if we had a group discussion, it would be like a study session? I would like to weigh in on this. I mean, I do have some pretty strong feelings about the current structure. I, I think I've made my views known to the, um, NPC ready group and you know whoever else has been on the calls so I mean I think thanks for doing a lot of the work um, but I think maybe you know the board should discuss it and maybe this is something that we have a study session on so that the public can be invited to hear it too well you know a study session you know Robert you know you're our board president and you know I'll, I'll yield to any type of uh, either a, a special session or just have it as part of our agenda and in, invite some of these groups in. Uh, so I'm receptive that way, but I think we're at a point here where we have Andreas now, which is a new hire. And of course, Ryan's setting up the new group and I think it's a good time for maybe for us as a board or like Virginia suggested a study session. We can have all these groups come in and you know, give us their opinion or we can just have these groups come to our emergency prep committee. And if you would like us, Robert, we can take it out at our committee level and do the same thing as to the aspect of the study session, which Virginia uh, made reference to. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily something that I would bless you on by, per se and, and be done with it. I think it's, it's part of a process that, that, and help me if I'm wrong, it might be wrong in this, but it was part of a process. I think the, the charge for the EPREP committee, if I, if I recollect, was to, uh, uh, by the board, was to look at whether CCM will continue to exist or not uh, in its current form, or will it, or, or does it need to be changed? And I, and I think that, to me, was the overall 
overall arts in charge for the the committee and and so part of anything that flows beyond that because you mentioned something about you know giving them money you talk about you know setting up who's gonna who's gonna deliver the funds if you look back at what the charter was when ccm before it was called ccm it was a new cert advisory board uh was was charged to to act independently <clears throat> on its own only tie-in they had was they they that um, we there was a coordinator over them that would manage the flow of information as well as resources somehow that didn't work out too well and so it became kind of um not working the way it was designed to do and so it's it's, it's been in that kind of limbo area for for some time and and part of what i thought the charge was the the, the eprep committee was to try to sort that out really because it's, it's a identity crisis you're going to be a 501c3 or not you know are you going to you know what what are what are your real roles and and taking that real role based upon one what the intent of that committee was which was to be that that link into the community uh via you know that you know by, for the fire district and so is that still going to be their, their role if not then they're going to give up the 501c3 and move back into an advisory role i don't know but i thought that was the charge because it's hard for me or maybe somebody else can it's hard for me to to say have a, a conversation about who how the who should get the money and how the money should be given what process should be used until we understand whether this this entity is gonna what form and fashion is gonna shape because you know three years ago EPA can do uh, not EPA can do uh, the, the East Palo Alto group submitted a proposal uh, Chuck wrote the proposal he's in our group and to get funded and that kind of went the way of a dinosaur you know never it, nothing ever had happened for it so that's what ccm or the advisory group was supposed to have identified and, and uh, corrected uh and became that adjunct or that 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 conduit for community groups and so that has it hasn't happened so it, it's in an identity crisis as far as i'm concerned i don't right. i don't know what it's going to do so right and Robert, you know, you make really good points. And if CCM is still not in a uh, nonprofit or 501c situation now, it's still not. Uh, maybe I can pose this to Stephen. You know, Stephen, in order for a volunteer group or an organization, you know, let's say even the Red Cross, all right, that wants assistance relative to our our funding. Uh, does it does it have to be a nonprofit? Does it have to be in you know like an organized LLC, or so, can it be like some of these neighborhood groups, even so. Um, Homeowners Association. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm not going to give you. I'm not going to give you the greatest answer that you're asking for, um, because I've been listening to this conversation. I'm a. Uh, I hate to be a sort of a policeman about this, but this is an agenda item just to get a report That's from a correct. committee. That's correct. And I feel it's a little bit to me like we're having a very interesting discussion that uh, you very rightly suggested might be agendized for a future meeting, and I, I would suggest that's probably the right way to handle this conversation. Okay. Yeah, well, I agree with you, Rob. I, I agree. I think it should be in a future meeting, it, but I, I think that it should be open. And I, I mean, I know it's always open, but with all of us and um, like a study session, I think it's an important thing. I think that the, the, the um, volunteers don't want to kind of be left out. They're very committed. And I think we need to at least hear what they have to say. I mean, that's what I'm hearing from the volunteers. So, I mean, without going into the substance, I agree with you, but I would prefer to have a study session with the, you know, the relevant parties, including the whole board and not just confine it to the emergency prep board or committee. But that's just me. Yeah. 
Chuck, would you like to add something to, to what we discussed at our meeting? Well, I think this is something that the whole, all the board members are interested in, and I, I agree that it should be a discussion. I, I have just one correction I wanted to make, Rob, just because I didn't want to leave the wrong impression here. Um, CCM is currently operating right now under the umbrella of a 501c3 organization, Peninsula Community Foundation. So yes. we, we, they are effectively a not-for-profit uh, public benefit corporation right now. I mean, they have that umbrella. Okay. Well, I, I just want one correction, Chuck, if I may. I, I think this, uh, the the uh, philanthropic venture. Uh, You're right. Uh, uh, uh huh. I, I made a mistake. You're correct. I said the wrong group. No, no. I'm just saying, not necessarily the group, but they they only act as the fiscal, the financial agent for them. That they just they 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 can't they not any money comes to them, uh, like the like the grant that they got, it went to that organization to hold, not to the fire district. So that's all, they're not operating on the, the other aspects of, of 501c3. That's, per, that's strictly um, uh, the CCM group. It's only the, the, fin the financial, the physical aspect of it that's been held by someone else. The money comes to them uh, for accountability and goes back out. Um, right, but I mean, our our discussion is whether or not we're going to meet, not about that. That's the question, and I think Chuck and I agree that at least the um, full board should be there. I think the volunteers would like to be there. I think it's important to get their input. That's well, why how, I'm proposing how, a study session. The, the question is, how does that fit into the priorities we talked about for for the EPRA group to look at? The what, where, Robert? Where, I can't where, hear. where would it fall into the priorities that well, we, that the board had to ask the the, the, the e prep group to look into? Well, it I know it's it's part of the fire district's accreditation process in their strategic plan when they do talk about volunteer groups. Uh, I, it's not a it's a peripheral policy that our board look into volunteer groups but it is a chief uh i don't know he's he's muted but um so i guess your report is pretty much kind of on the kind of what what's yeah. your next step what do you want from the from the board i guess that's that's the bottom line well i think your suggestion is does the entire board want to discuss this involving the CCM or these other independent volunteer groups or send it back to the EPREP committee and within the EPREP committee's process have these volunteer groups uh, meet with us and we'll report back to the board or does the entire board want to be part of this discussion? It's up to you, Robert, you know. No, it's not up to me. No, it's, it's up, up to, to the board. board. I would like to, to be part of this discussion. That's the reason I suggested it. I agree with Chuck that the, if the board wants to have this and be a part of this, it's important enough to, to for us to be a part of. It's the volunteer group. We're volunteers. Chuck and I and Robert are CERT members, you know, so I think it's important for the whole group, the whole board. To, to be able to have the discussion. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> That's why I brought Thanks, it up. Thanks, Robert. Rob, I, I know. I mean, so that you asked the question. I think yeah. the whole board should be participating in this. Okay, well, where are we gonna go from here? <laughs> Any recommendations? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm what, what the board want to do? You want, I mean, refer back to the EPREP committee for further deliberation to, uh, to conduct the meetings. Uh, what did the board want to do? What do you guys want to do? I, I already gave my perspective. I think it, we should have a, like a study session, full board kind of study session with yeah, I, input. I, I would support a study session. I, I think this is, uh, again, very timely given the uh, 
uh, the epidemic, uh, given some of the issues that have surfaced uh, in our relationships with the cities and with the, the various groups, uh, I think it warrants uh, special attention. I, I would favor a, a study group approach. And Jim, even looking beyond the current pandemic, I mean, in the future, what is it going to look like too? Sure. Yeah. A natural disaster, uh, you know, it, may, it could take a, a number of different forms. So or what are you saying? You, said you want the, this to go back to the EPREP committee to set up the logistics of it? What do you, what do you? I, I think that'd be a good approach. You know, let, uh, ask EPREP to uh, develop, uh, you know, the issues and, and uh, you know, consider, you know, what presentations would be useful and effective, uh, you know, which groups would participate, individuals, etc. cetera. I, I think uh, EPREP is in a good uh, position. Starting point. Yeah, it's I, a together yeah. program. Yeah, Robert? Yeah, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't mind taking it back. Uh, go uh, have these groups come to us. We formulate some type of plan and come back to the entire board and present it. Well, wait, so, so, so are you saying, Rob, then that means that the board wouldn't give input to the plan? Because that's not what I'm, I'm not well, well, we would present some recommendations that the, in the, these individual volunteer groups would meet with us. Well, then that's not a study session. Study that's board. bringing the whole thing back to the EPREP committee and doing what we would normally do, which is, that's, that's not what I was thinking. But again, I'm one of five and I think a study session with the whole board to come up with what we think we sh this should look like is also important and not just the recommendation from the EPREP committee, which is fine, but I just think that it's it's important enough for the full board to discuss. At least that's what I'm hearing from the volunteers that um, I've been speaking with and you know, in the calls that I've been on for with MPC Ready, for example. I, I think we need to kind of step back a little bit and understand, uh, I think Stephen just kind of defined what, what committees should do, whether it's, a, it's an ad hoc committee, whether it's a standing committee, what the committee should do to help shape policies and direction for the board. I understand what the and committees that, can do, Robert. I understand let, that. Let me, let me finish, if I may. And the only thing I'm just trying to outline is that the EPREP committee haven't brought from my own, it's what I'm looking at, I don't see anything I'm hearing, they haven't made any recommendation to us from, 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 from CCM or the community. And if part of a due diligence part of trying to understand from the community, from CCM, CCM how, uh, uh, how, what they need, I, I, you know, having a study session to have people to come and tell us about it, well, we don't need to have an EPREP committee. To do that, we could just do it all. We, that's we just, well, no, that I think that. we're at that. I think we're at that stage. That's why I'm suggesting that, Robert. Why okay. is it that you don't want to have a study session? I did. Did I say I didn't want to have? It? I don't think. Well, I, I mean, that. I'm I, I don't think it's the, a hard if you thing let me to listen, do. If you, just hold on for a second. If you let, I'm explaining the process. What what we all kind of agree on how things will operate, and that was the the committees will look at study issues and bring bring back their recommendation, like what Jim and I did on strategic planning, like what we did in finance. We looked at the issue, we studied, we brought back a recommendation. Yeah, I, I know what that is, Robert. I so want I'm, to be a part said, of that. Well, you That's why I'm asking for a study a, session. As a board member, you will be a part of that study not, I, session not, once it come, the information comes back to you. I don't want to be there at the end when there are recommendations being presented. I want to be part of the discussion. That's why I'm bringing this up as a study session rather than going back to the EPREP. But again, I'm again, I'm vote. one I mean, person. It, that, yeah. That's not, I understand we what the process is, Robert. I, okay. I understand what the process is. So, I understand the committee format. I understand the committee process. That's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for what? something that's not the committee process, which is a study session. And I think Jim was 
okay with that, but with the EPREP committee at least trying to set the agenda or the outline of what we would study, you know, the, I, um, the I guess the appropriate people to bring in to the discussion from the volunteer groups. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to put words in Jim's mouth. That's how I've interpreted that. I understand what the process is for a committee. That's not what I'm asking for. We've already done that. I'm asking for a study session for the full board to be able to discuss this and listen to, um, I, I, to, to listen to members of the public who are actually involved. I, I mean, I want to hear it firsthand right now, not second. So what is the wishes of the board? Um, is there a motion, is that a motion or is that a, so we move, move this Robert. agenda? Robert, could I make a Chuck? suggestion? Yeah, go ahead. Floor is open. Well, let me say, I think even as a member of the committee, I, I, I think maybe we ought to hear from the public who are the volunteers. And I think this idea of a study session that instead of me talking or Virginia talking or Rob, whatever, that maybe it would be good to give kind of maybe a, a, almost a priority placement, five or 10 minutes to CCM, five or 10 minutes to NPC Ready, five or 10 minutes to uh, Impact, and five or 10 minutes to Repact, and listen what they have to say, and then listen to the general public about what, what should the district be doing in terms of volunteering. And that doesn't preclude us from making statements at the end, but I think it would be great if we could actually listen to what people have to say about this, because I think there are some strong opinions, and I think perhaps even differing opinions, but I don't know that. And um, I, I, there's certainly a lot of people who've been involved for a long time who might not be the leader or the spokesperson. So if we scheduled, say, an hour at one of our board members to have a study session, no action taken, um, and just heard from the public I think that would help the e-prep committee go back and then discuss what we heard and see where we wanted to go. And we could certainly, again, at that study session, have the board members speak um, if they have opinions or anyway, that's what I'm recommending is we study a public, we, we schedule a public session where we listen for a change. Are you making a motion, Chuck? Because if you make that motion, I'll second it. Okay, I'll make that a motion that we put on the agenda a one hour study session of the future of the, our volunteers and the volunteer uh, organizations in the district. I'll second that. Motion been made. Um, it's been seconded. Uh, call for discussion. Robert? Yes, Rob. Well, this could also be twofold for us because what we can do is if we do have the study session, we can, whatever the results are of that study session, we can always bring it back to the emergency prep committee and finalize it with a recommendation and then bring it back to the entire board. So I think it's a win-win myself. So I agree. So, you. so do you, you want to add that to Chuck's motion? <laughs> Chuck, will you accept that? Uh, As a, well, or do you, let's just do the study session first and then we'll move forward from there. Well, Robert, Robert? Yes, yes Rob. May I speak? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, I want to recognize the board president that you yeah. know, we shouldn't be yelling and screaming at one. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that, as I said, after the, the study session, okay, we can always bring it back to the emergency prep committee and Chuck and I can finalize it and make recommendations to bring it back to the entire board for a vote or a policy and procedure uh, review or whatever you want to do it. But uh, it, I think it's a win-win for both. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Thanks for your, your uh, good analogies. Uh, so a motion been made, uh, uh, second and discussion, any more discussion? If not, call for a vote on it. Uh, is there a public comment on this section? I We have no public comment. No public comment. So we uh, roll call vote. Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director Solano? Aye. 
Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. So we move on to item, uh, we're going to um, EPREP uh, Finance Committee. Yeah, we just had a meeting um, and basically <clears throat> what we had tonight in terms of moving forward with station four was the recommendation. And so I'll thank you to the board for approving that. Robert, do you have anything to add from the Finance Committee? No, I, yeah, I think you covered it well. Is that it? Yeah, um, that's for the committee reports. We haven't done the director's reports yet, right? Or are we doing the director reports too? Um, I was running through the committee reports okay. and then we'll come back to okay. the director's report. Okay. Um, so uh, only uh, it's the um, strategic planning committee. Um, <clears throat> so Jim and I met on uh, August the um, uh, 4th uh, through a Zoom conference call uh, and myself, uh, Jim was in, as well as Michelle and the chief was in, a, in attendance uh, at that meeting uh, along with um, um, Belinda, our, our, our consultant. Uh, the committee had were assigned two objectives, um, uh, and the aim uh, was twofold. One was to develop a strategic plant strategy for each area of priority uh, that was given to us, and two, identify uh, relevant tasks associated with accomplishing each strategic category. Um, the strategic planning committee uh, working goal is to develop a preliminary draft of the Board of Directions 2020 work priorities, uh, which was A through Z uh, by September um, uh, at the, for the next board, September board meeting. Uh, <clears throat> how we were, there's, there's two <clears throat> ways we looked at accomplishing that task. The first way uh, was that we looked at and talked about how uh, was to, for the strategic planning committee members, which is Jim and myself, to divide uh, the priority list between the two of us. There was nine, uh, eight, nine areas, and so we each took um, uh, a portion of that. Uh, and the goal, the working goal was the intent is to, uh, in order to speed up uh, uh, the process to of attaining a preliminary draft, to get a preliminary draft back to the board for consideration. Um, the second objective accomplishment that I thought we was pretty good that we had was, and we talked about it uh, in I, item number nine, which was the, uh, this, we discussed the improvement project um, options and made the recommendations. Uh, so from that, uh, Jim, I don't know if you have any, any further comments, uh, please jump in. Uh, at any time. So the committee mem members are uh, working on the task. Uh, before next, uh, our next uh, committee meeting, uh, Jim and I will consult, uh, talk with the consultant uh, uh, on con uh, furthering the development uh, strategies uh, and priorities uh, for the board of directors uh, out that was outlined for 2020. Uh, so hopefully we can be able to come back with a draft uh, so the board can begin to kind of uh, look at and make, make recommendations and, and help finalize the, the, our, uh, our goals uh, for, for, this, for this year. Um, Jim, any comments to you? No, I think that captured it well, uh, Robert. You know, we discussed uh, you know, uh, conforming uh, the board goals to the strategic goals so that they're, you know, and that's what we'll be focusing on with, uh, with our consultant. You know, they should be complementary to, to one another. Um, so uh, move, now uh, we'll move into uh, uh, the, the ad hoc committee. Have anything that they uh, want to report on? Uh, not at this time. Uh, and then um, uh, directors go uh, meetings, Virginia. Yeah, sure. I'll just start. I heard, um, and maybe Harold. I don't. Harold, are you still there? He's on mute. 
Well, anyway, I heard from, um, okay, I heard from a member of the public um, a few days ago about these, um, what he would call absolutely grotesque water con control devices that have been installed. And um, so I responded to him and actually I got the information from Harold. So, I mean, Harold, would you mind just kind of just telling um, the board what it is exactly um, these water control devices are and what our obligations are as a fire district just and I'm only bringing this up only because this is what um, he told Harold told me but just in case the other directors get this kind of question then you'd have the information at hand so you know what director Crawley is referring to is you know it, it would what I would say is an oversized um, exterior water uh, device or fixture um, that when, when the question came up, it was, I think, thought that the fire district was requiring these large apparatus or structures um, for sprinkler systems. And really the only thing that we require, and this is right from the fire marshal, is, you know, a fire department connection, typically two ends where we can pump into, um, you know, you see them a lot in cities, right? They're in walls and so forth. You, you see them in different buildings around the area where they may come up out of the ground, out of a pipe. Um, you know, they need to be accessible. They're typically uh, somewhere in the front of the building. Um, although there are some unique places that you can find them. I'm not sure why these things happen in the past, but I know that we had, have one for one of our schools um, that's hit the back of the building and a fence. And so if you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't know where to find it. Um, I know there was a lot in um, North Fair Oaks that for a building next door, there was a street that had the FDC, the Fire Department Connection on that street. So if you didn't know where to go, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of that. So you know, things have been done weirdly in the past in location. But in this particular case, what Virginia showed me and what they sent in was this large, you know, imagine valve system. Well, when I asked John, I said, what is that? What is all that stuff? And it's all backflow. And so those devices are intended to not contaminate the municipal water supply system. And a lot of this stuff now is state standards for environmental related issues. So the bottom line is, is that if, if, there, if you have these large valve systems, it's because they have all these different backflow devices. And that's not required by us. That's typically the water purveyor following state standards and uh, working with the contractor, the property owner, and then the, the jurisdiction to put these in. So, you know, it, it, with the way this was going was where I think we were getting blamed for something where you know really a small portion of what we need is is adequate but all the other parts are things that again a lot of rules have sprung up around and they're very expensive too so that's it i think that's what so, so if you get a question about that you'll know how to answer now thank you virginia can i ask this, what what is this on residential structures well i think it is because there are numbers here let me let me try to put it up. Um, there are address numbers. I told Harold I thought they were phone numbers, but in looking at this again, they're like six digit numbers and it's an address range. So here's- yeah, what I, I think you're looking at a condo complex and yeah. apartments. Yeah. So that's, so a, that's a complex versus a- um, Pretty pretty typical. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, in, in most new homes will have anti-siphon now and all your all your water fixtures. I mean, look, all these things are made so that it doesn't contaminate the water supply. And again, that's all considered environmental. And that's yeah. all, it's all dictated by the state. Chuck, I'll send the pictures out to Michelle if she wouldn't well, mind. I know what they are. I didn't realize that, I, I, I didn't think they were required for single family homes. So that's why I was- so oh, 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 sorry, okay, yeah. Yeah, but I just wanted Harold to, um, you know, talk about it a little bit in case anyone gets questions about it, because I had not heard about this until, I mean, I haven't seen them, but I haven't looked and been out either. So thank you, Harold.
Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, and like anything else, those are real ugly until the building's on fire and you can pump <laughs> into them and it puts the fire out. Yeah, thanks. There you go. That's it. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Uh, anybody else? A report? Liaison reports? Uh, hearing none. Um, uh, we'll move on to president report. There's two things that I want to uh, mention, two areas I want to mention. The first is that I met with the chief and I have um, got together along with Jim to do um, agenda planning um, uh, for this board meeting. Uh, I also met with uh, Mayor Taylor to discuss the homeless encampment and the possibility of, of building a homeless housing uh, at uh, somewhere along that, uh, the, um, that site that's boarding uh, Facebook and the um, 60 acres. Um, and I talked also with two other developers uh, regarding that particular possibility of, of going in and uh, partnering with the city on, on that. Um, Project We Hope, you probably uh, may have seen the big bus that they have run it riding around uh, the community, very East, East Palo Alto, and, and I think Menlo Park in the Bellhaven area. That particular director um, uh, is interested also in, in, in building some um, homeless shelters uh, uh, in, in Menlo Park is in East Palo Alto. And then there's another foundation I've been talking to uh, who approached me about about building too? So, it, it the reason I engage in that level of conversation with people is one I you know I know that that development business um, for many many years on the nonprofit perspective, and two I think anytime I hear that the firefighters having to respond to fires, respond to the emergency things that go on over there. It's a health and safety issue for our firefighters. You know, they don't know what they're going into when they go out there. So I think whatever you know, I can do to push that narrative along, I will. I feel like it's, it'll benefit the fire district. So those are the kind of things that I've I've been working on over the past month. Uh, and I have one other item that I want to before we close our session, unless somebody else got something to say. And that that is that. Uh, this campaign, this election is, is, uh, is, is a bonus. And what I'm about to say is pertaining to all the candidates running for the Menlo Park Fire Protection District Board of Directors seat. Uh, at this point in time, I have decided to withdraw my endorsement for all candidates. I value and respect each candidate and each of you. However, as the current board president, I feel that I must remain neutral during this election process and would ask that you please remove my name from any uh, media or advertising mentioning my name as an endorser. Um, uh, and I just wanna thank you for uh, uh, being supportive of me over the years, but I like to say all of the candidates in, engage in this process. I like them as a person uh, and it's a very tough, difficult situation that I'm in. And um, I just want to say that's it. So if there's any other you know, public comments, number three, Michelle. Uh, there, give me one second. And there are no public comments. Okay, uh, then a call for adjournment. I'll move to adjourn. A second. We move the second in the discussion. If not, then I call the meeting uh, to a close. A roll call vote. Roll call vote to close. Thank you. Director Bernstein? Aye. Director Crawley? Aye. Director Solana? Aye. Director McLaughlin? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Meeting is closed. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank you.